Good afternoon, everyone. It is exactly 12 p.m. Thursday, May 26, 2022. And I'm calling to order the virtual meeting of the Los Angeles Probation Oversight Commission. My name is Frankie Carrillo, and I am the chair of the commission. As we begin, Wendy Julian, our executive director, will explain how those of you joining us today can participate during this meeting. And then, Wendy, please take the roll. Thank you, Chair Carrillo, and welcome everyone. We encourage public um, participation in all of the Probation Oversight Commission meetings. We welcome your comments writing or in writing or live today. Uh, there will be an opportunity for you to comment on each individual item on the agenda after the panel presentation is made and before the commissioners discuss or take any action on the item. Uh, so if you'd like to make public comment, uh, the easiest way is to pre-register when you register for the meeting and then we'll have your name on a list. But if you're already here and want to speak on an item, you're welcome to use the raise your hand icon. If you click on the participants button, then you'll see a tiny hand in the bottom and you click on it and it will raise your hand. Uh, if you're calling in, you're also welcome to raise your hand to get into the queue to speak. To do that, just dial star three on your phone. And after you give your comment, we ask you to put your hand down either by clicking the hand icon again or dialing star three on your phone again. And then if you want to comment on another item, you can put your hand up in the other item. If you'd prefer to make your public comment in writing, uh, and you can do both if you want, please send us an email to info at poc.lacounty.gov. That's in the chat. Uh, please don't send your public comment in the chat. The way we have it set up, uh, the commissioners don't see the chat. And also, uh, it's not a part of the public record as it doesn't comply with the Brown Act for our responsibilities. So if you wish to give public comment, Please either raise your hand and speak in the meeting or send us an email. Um, our commission meeting is being li uh, broadcast live on Facebook. You can watch it on Facebook, but there's no engagement with users there. Please also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram at LA County POC for more information about our meetings, uh, these meetings and also town halls and other interesting things that we're working on. Uh, we've also recently launched a YouTube account. You can watch the full meeting broadcast on the YouTube account or a recap. Uh, that will give you a sense of what happened during the meeting. Uh, bienvenidos a todos los que prefieren hacer sus comentarios en español. Uh, ustedes tendrán cuatro minutos para su comentario y podemos proveer traducción al inglés si quiere. Al iniciar su comentario, nomás avísenos, por favor, que prefiere hacer su comentario en español. All commenters will have two minutes per comment today, unless the chair deems that we don't have enough time for that, at which time he may uh, reduce the time uh, to one minute. I'm now going to call the roll. Commissioners, if you could please unmute yourself when your name is called. Commissioner Canales? Present. Thank you. Commissioner Dupuy? Present. Commissioner Garcia Lays? Present. Commissioner Jackson? I am here. Commissioner Lewis? I don't see, but we will indicate when he joins. I am expecting him today. Commissioner Meredith? I also don't see Commissioner Meredith. Uh, Janae, if you could look in the um, attendee list for both of them, that would be great so we can bring them up if they need be. Uh, Commissioner Nong? Uh, good afternoon, President. And Commissioner Yamashiro is going to uh, join us later. I actually see Commissioner Lewis has joined us. Commissioner Lewis, would you like to uh, announce that you're present? Uh, President, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. And Chair Carrillo? I'm here, but also Commissioner Yamashiro is in the house as well. Oh, fantastic. Commissioner Yamashiro. Thank you. I didn't see your name pop up. Present. Fantastic. All right, we have quorum and I'll turn it back over to you, Chair Carrillo. Thank you, Wendy. We will now proceed with the agenda items for today. Item number two is your approval of May 12th minutes. Do you have any written public comments or live public comments for this item, Wendy? We do not. Okay. May I have a motion to approve May 12th minutes? Motion to approve. We have a motion by Commissioner Canales, second by. I'll second it. Commissioner Dupuy, thank you. Are there any changes to the minutes? Okay, hearing none, commissioners, please unmute yourselves and vote, uh, vote with a voice vote. Aye. 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 Sounds unanimous to me. Motion carries. Moving on to item number three is to discuss and take appropriate actions on the issues of, of electronic monitoring by the Los Angeles County Probation Department. Ms. Vrani from the UCLA School of Law published a report on the pretrial electronic monitoring, which has been attached to this agenda. 
representatives from the probation department, including Deputy Chief Karen Fletcher and Deputy Director Richard Rigon, are also here to answer uh, commissioners' questions and respond to the report. Welcome back, Ms. Verani and Deputy Chiefs. Um, Ms. Verani, if you would uh, begin. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me. I think I have sent over some slides. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I am Alicia Verani. I'm the director of the criminal justice program here at UCLA School of Law. And uh, in earlier this year, I published this report on pretrial electronic monitoring in LA County. Uh, covering the years 2015 through 2021. All of the data and information included in this report was obtained through Public Records Act requests to the Probation Department here in LA County. Um, and so I'll get started with um, just a general overview, and I'm sure the Probation Department can provide more insight as well since they're here. Um, but the Probation Department here in LA County runs two electronic monitoring programs. One is uh, called the electronic monitoring program, and it's the one that is has been in existence the longest. The second is the supervised release program, which was funded by the Judicial Council and started in 2020. Uh, the electronic monitoring program EMP runs in all courthouses throughout LA County, and the supervised release program SRP runs only in the downtown courthouse and Lancaster courthouse. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide. So I'm going to go over the findings of the report. Um, one of the most uh, critical findings is that since 2015, the number of people on pretrial electronic monitoring has increased by 5,250%. Uh, this data is, um, you know, pretty shocking to to just look at and see as I was looking. Uh, through things, uh, much of the growth can be attributed to the implementation of the supervised release program here in LA County. As you can see from the graph, uh, 2020 really is what uh, started um, or where uh, it began to increase. But, it, you know, electronic monitoring began to increase also back in 2017 um, just through the electronic monitoring program itself. So we already see an increasing reliance on electronic monitoring starting in 2017. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, LA County runs both a pretrial and a post-sentence or post-conviction electronic monitoring program. What we see here is that uh, at this moment in time, or in 2021, pretrial electronic monitoring was outpacing post-sentence electronic monitoring by five times as many people. Um, so you see starting off in 2015, the post-sentence folks on EM are, were basically um, at the same level as now the pretrial electronic monitoring. So the curves have reversed um, with pretrial versus post-conviction. Next slide, please. Uh, and these are a couple of other findings of the report. So in 2021, 31% of people placed on pretrial EM were black, 53% were Latinx, 12% were white, and 4% were in the other category. Only 45% of people placed on EM via the supervised release program actually successfully completed the program, so less than half of the people. And then the EMP program, 65% of people successfully completed it, but that's down from a completion rate of 89% um, in 2016. So the completion rate of these programs is, um, in one is declining and, and the other is already fairly low. And then we see that uh, the majority of people were spending at least 65 to 71 days, so a little over two months on EM with a third of people spending at least over six months on EM. And I say at least because the data set that I had still had people who were on EM at that time, so we couldn't calculate um, the full length of time that they were on EM. So, um, you know, with more time and additional data, it may be revealed that people are on EM even longer than we had originally calculated. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And um, so this shows the termination statistics from each program. Uh, so out of the people who were terminated for the electronic monitoring program, most of the people were terminated for noncompliance. And this is something that you hear um, with increasing concern across the country is that people are being terminated 
and reincarcerated, um, not for a new arrest, not for failing to appear necessarily, um, but for these technical violations of the electronic monitoring programs rules. So for the EMP program, non-compliance was the highest uh, uh, reason for termination. And then for the supervised release program, you had failures to appear being the first uh, highest reason for termination, and then abscon was the second highest at 38%. Uh, one other uh, quick finding from the report is that through the supervised release program, judges have the opportunity to choose electronic monitoring or standard monitoring, which is probation check-ins, but not uh, electronic monitoring. However, at the Lancaster Courthouse, judges are choosing electronic monitoring 92% of the time. And at the downtown courthouse, they were choosing it 60% of the time. And so, you know, this kind of shows that if judges are presented with the opportunity to uh, place somebody on EM pretrial, that they will take that opportunity rather than uh, look to other alternatives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, and now we're going to turn to some of the EM program requirements. These were taken from uh, the documents that probation shared in their electronic monitoring and supervised release uh, manual. And so there are just a few that I want to point out that really um, give probation case managers broad discretion to terminate somebody from EM. So if you look at uh, this provision here, again, this is taken from uh, the Corrective Solutions Participant Orientation Packet. Uh, Corrective Solutions is one of the companies that probation contracts with for EM. If you look at C, uh, people can be uh, terminated and reincarcerated uh, for a failure of the equipment. So it's not a failure of, of anything that they're doing, um, but failure of the equipment can, re can result in uh, termination and reincarceration. And then if you look at D, it says any negative behavior resulting in the court or probation officer's belief that you may not complete the program successfully. Um, that's a pretty vague standard for reincarceration, uh, gives case managers broad discretion to terminate people. Um, and one can imagine that implicit bias could also play a role in terms of probation officers uh, determining what negative behavior is. Um, there's really not any criteria. It's just this broad category of negative behavior. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the other requirements um, uh, that are pretty onerous when someone signs up for pretrial electronic monitoring is that they have to have any of their schedule changes approved 24 hours in advance uh, to their probation case manager. Um, I'm sure most folks here know that there are quite a few jobs where uh, schedules can change, you know, the morning of, um, and it makes it very difficult for people or, or childcare issues come up or a health emergency comes up. Um, it makes it very difficult for people to report these 20, these changes 24 hours in advance. Again, then, if we when we look at number five here uh, and five C and D, these are again pretty vague um, descriptions of when a probation officer can retake somebody into custody. So, if I give the court or probation department reason to believe that I would not complete the program successfully, uh, it's very unclear as to what that means. There's no direction to the individual as to what that could mean. You know, it could be something um, that's relatively egregious or something very minor, um, but there's no clarity here and again gives probation broad discretion. And next slide, please. And then there are two here that I wanted to point out. One is that um, the consumption of alcohol in any form is prohibited. Um, well, as we all know, for folks over the age of 21, alcohol is legal and this seems to prohibit alcohol for anybody, no matter what their offenses, even if it has nothing to do with drugs or alcohol, which seems uh, to be an overly broad condition. And then um, number 15 is that they are they have to agree that they will be subject to search and seizure at any time without warrant or without probable cause. Now, these are conditions that aren't even always placed on people who are sentenced. And we're talking here about people who are pretrial, who are presumed innocent. So I just really want us to keep that in mind that a lot of these conditions are incredibly onerous, um, very burdensome, 
Uh, one of the conditions is that people are only allowed t up to 12 hours per week to search for a job and they have to provide documentation of uh, the, you know, where they're going to look for a job, the address. Uh, again, job hunting doesn't always work that way or fall along these strict lines. Um, people might need more than 12 hours a day outside of the home um, for, for job hunting and this doesn't really um, provide for that. And so I want to move on to just talking a little bit about, um, you know, why does this matter and why should we care? So the research on pretrial EM is pretty inconclusive and mostly takes into consideration only whether EM prevents failures to appear or rearrest, but doesn't really look at the impact of electronic monitoring on individuals' lives. Um, as, as I noted with some of the owner's conditions, it can really hamper people's ability to uh, take care of their children, to find a job, to sustain a job. One study found that 22% of people placed on EM were fired or asked to leave their job because of the electronic monitor. People on EM have had medical issues uh, due to the device causing sores on their ankles. Um, and not being able to get the device removed, even though there were medical issues arising. People have missed important events like the birth of their child because they could not get their EM schedule changed. Um, and so when we're thinking about people released pretrial, we want to support them in pursuing the life that they want in terms of housing, employment, education, all of the things that we know actually reduce contact with the system. Um, but, but this electronic monitoring program really seems to infringe upon people's ability to do these things, to obtain gainful employment, to take care of their children, um, to find housing if they need to. Uh, oftentimes we hear the argument that EM is better than jail. Um, and so why don't we want to have EM rather than having people incarcerated, especially as a county, we're looking to reduce the jail population. Um, and certainly as a former public defender myself, I had clients who uh, opted into EM rather than having to spend another day or week or months in jail. So I understand that argument. However, these are not our only options and to, um, you know, sort of reduce our options to EM or jail and saying EM is better than jail is kind of a very low standard for what we want for people in the county who are accused of crimes. Um, and I also want to say from my report, it's unclear as to whether EM is actually being used in lieu of jail, because what we see over time is that the rate, or the number of people on EM is going up over time. Um, and at the same time, the number of people who are held in pretrial detention in LA County jails is also going up. So we see that both things are going up rather than EM being used as an, necessarily as an alternative. So really it's being used to expand the scope of people who are being surveilled by the probation department. Um, as you all know, the county is moving towards an independent pretrial services agency outside of law enforcement. So we need to really start rethinking whether EM has any role to play in this new system that we are trying to build. And recently, the Vera Institute of Justice put out a brief that talks about how conditions like electronic monitoring and drug testing and alcohol testing should be avoided in supportive pretrial programs, both because they um, inhibit people's ability to thrive in the pretrial context and that there is really no evidence to show that it supports the goals of preventing recidivism and preventing failures to appear. And so lastly, I'll move on to what I think this commission can do, and then I'm happy to take questions. Um, I think it's imperative for this commission to really grapple with whether EM should continue to exist in this county, um, given that there is inconclusive evidence around EM and weighing that against the harms and burdens of EM on Angelinos. EM cannot be seen as a best or humane practice when we're talking about a care first model. Short of recommending the end of both EM programs, there are a few other moves this commission may choose to make. Uh, firstly, requesting the probation department to report to your commission on the following. The research and evidence that was considered when adopting these two EM programs regarding EM's relationship to public safety. Second, whether any fees are still being imposed upon individuals pre-trial or post-conviction. 
uh, as related to electronic monitors. Uh, for probation to conduct a review of the technical violations, uh, the not the quote unquote noncompliance of EM and present data on specifically what these noncompliance violations were for. After this review to present their recommendations to your commission for changing the EM contract to reduce the number of technical violations. Again, as you saw in the statistics, the technical violations are really the majority of why people are being reincarcerated. And so it's incredibly important to understand what those technical technical violations are for and if something can be changed in the contract um, to reduce those violations. Um, and in, in addition, um, the probation department should report on expanding the time that individuals have to seek employment, as well as shortening the advance notice they have to provide if their work schedule or other schedules change. Also in this presentation, uh, the probation department should present data on how frequently the department itself recommends EM to the court versus how frequently the court orders EM without a probation uh, department recommendation. That is data that I did not have. Uh, additionally, to present data on how frequently probation recommends the removal of an EM condition after a person has been in compliance. And then to, to also report back on funding. So to provide a detailed report on how they're spending the $1.4 million that was approved last year in the 2021 budget for the EMP program, a detailed report about how they are spending the judicial council funding for the SRP program, and whether uh, they're receiving any funding via AB 109 or any other funding mechanisms uh, to support EM programming. Uh, a few more. So request for the probation department to change their policy on abscons. Right now, the policy is that if they can't get in touch with somebody in four hours, that they provide a non-compliance report to the court and that person will be terminated and considered to have been absconded. In Illinois, they recently just passed a law where they changed the abscond hours to 48 hours. So I would encourage that change, especially given that we're seeing a large number of people being terminated for absconds in the SRP program. Uh, request for the probation department to remove the search and seizure condition for people who are on pretrial EM. And then request of a policy uh, that will regularly review people on EM and recommend that EM be removed if there has been compliance. The SRP manual does have such a policy, which is why I'm asking for data to see whether probation is actually reviewing people and recommending their removal. Um, but that policy requires a, remo a, a review after 90 days, and I would encourage that that, be, that uh, review be moved up and be considered at an earlier time. It's also unclear whether the probation officers assigned to the EMP program have to conduct a similar review, so the policy should be consistent across both programs. Uh, I believe that's all that I have. Um, I had put, yeah, thank you so much. That's my email address if folks have questions and I'm happy to take questions now as well. Thank you, Ms. Verani. We're gonna hold off on the questions and let probation uh, respond to that first. And, but before I pass it over to Ms. Fletcher, and Mr. Garon, who have um, slides I, I heard, um, I want to just acknowledge that Mr. Uh, Commissioner Meredith is in the house as well. So, hi, Don. Ms. Fletcher, Mr. Giron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Carrillo. Um, on behalf of probation, I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide an overview of pretrial from uh, the probation department. Um, and thank you for the pretrial report through UCLA. Um, Richard Heron is our deputy director who oversees uh, pretrial diversion in this county for probation. And I know that he has staff on the line as well. Uh, what we would like to do is to cover how probation receives referrals uh, of clients on pretrial, the court process as it relates to decisions made about who is placed on pretrial um, and uh, how they are monitored in the community and um, kind of an explanation and an overview of the staff um, who handle these cases. They are all non-sworn, they are not probation officers, which is one of the um, highlights of this program and a highlight that many counties are looking toward uh, to remove sworn staff in the monitoring of 
these individuals in the community. So, Mr. Harone, I will let you go through your slides and then certainly we can be available for questions after the presentation. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Karen, and, and uh, greetings, uh, commissioners, and thank you for, for this opportunity uh, to, to talk about pretrial and electronic monitoring. And I do want to thank uh, the UCLA researcher. Thank you. You know, we always want effective programs. You know, we're always internally looking at how our programs are operating. So it's, so it's, I hear her recommendations. We'll take a look at them. A couple, um, I, I, as I go through my slides, I'm going to answer many of her questions. Uh, and a couple of things that, that we want to stress is the touch points uh, in the court proceedings. You know, how cases come to us, uh, decision made uh, on, on those that get, you know, terminated. Um, all, all folks are, are court ordered. Um, and I'm going to cover, if we go to this first slide, please. First slide. Okay, thank you. So, so we have four programs that, that have electronic monitoring in our department. And I'm going to highlight the pretrial ones. Uh, we have supervised release, electronic monitoring that were just covered. Um, we're going, we're going to talk about uh, CDP, our, our Juvenile uh, Services Bureau uh, that has electronic monitoring, and then our GPS that, that's under our AB 109 Bureau. So, so we have four programs, and I wanted to give uh, the commission what those numbers currently look like. So if you take a look at the supervised release um, section, there's currently two, 522 on the program, and of those 522, 145 are only monitoring only. They're not on GPS or electronic monitoring. Uh, and um, GPS, we have 341. And then we have we have those that have a combination of GPS and alcohol testing. Uh, those are 36. So that comprises the 522. All of those are court ordered with, with the conditions document um, and their supervised release that we'll go back to it later in the presentation. And going to electronic monitoring, currently we have 425, and of those 425, uh, 334 are are pre 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 conviction, and uh, court ordered post conviction are 80, and the sheriff post is is one is is 11. Uh, there was some mention in the report that that numbers dipped. The sheriff that that is true. Um, those those numbers, the sheriffs are placing people on other programs as well. It's voluntary, um, and those that are in custody have to agree to, to be released on electronic monitoring. Uh, both programs, the supervised release and the electronic monitoring, are free. There, there's no charges to, to, to those participants. So I want to make that clear. We, we've made that change uh, about two years now, so there's no cost. I know we saw some conditions, and on there was a, there was a dollar amount for testing. That, that's not in place. Um, and moving over to uh, CDP, that's our, our community detention program for juveniles, for our minors or our, our youth. Um, there's 111 there currently. And then lastly, our, our AB 109 GPS clients, uh, there's 236. Uh, of those 236, 190 are on AB 109 supervision, and we have 46 on felony community supervision. Uh, those are I'll cover it later, high static 99 assessments that are mandated, and those are mandated to be on GPS. That's a quick overview on, on what it looks like, um, large scale current. If we can move to the next slide, please. And here are the descriptions uh, on electronic monitoring and supervised release. Um, you know, we have, you know, per penal code 1203.016 authorizes electronic monitoring. And we have a supervised release program. Uh, the definite, I wanted to have a reference on, on program descriptions for, for everybody. Uh, they're, they're two different, and I'll get to go through them as we as we move along. Uh, next slide, please. So this one this one's a, a busy slide, but it's important and a lot of data. It's on our supervisor. And if I could uh, bring to everybody's attention, there's a typo there. It started 6-20-2020. Uh, so that's a typo in that very first label. Um, but we have a supervised release started. It's been two years now. This is our third installment. Uh, within pretrial, we've had supervised release tw two other prior times, uh, and it was uh, eliminated due to, due to funding. Um, 
but those are our numbers. Um, and if you look at the rates, it's super busy. I wanted to give you all the detail that we have. Uh, FTAs are, are a big concern. Uh, they're the largest group. And if you take a look at each slide has FTA, APSCON, new arrests, and non-compliance rates. And, the, and the, we group them as misconduct, um, FTA, APSCON, new arrests, non-compliance, and it's broken up by each year. And the bottom has a total. Uh, as you could see, the, the FTAs are the highest. Um, first year was about 21% in total. Second year, it improved to 16, and overall, it's about 19%. And if you go to the non-compliance, uh, those numbers are 3%. It's remain consistent about 3%. Uh, the new arrests are also at 5%. They went down the second year to 2%. And the APSCON rate is 11%, 12%, and 11%. If you add all those up, uh, those are the uh, supervised release misconduct percentages. Um, any, uh, if we could go on to the next one, and I could go back to questions. Um, there was a question about the, and with supervised release, there, there's a connection to services. So we have Project 180 uh, that provides these services, education, employment, housing, mental health, trauma, drug treatment, alcohol treatment. Those are all available for those that are on supervised release. Um, that's in place now uh, through funding. Um, we, we, we're happy to provide services to those that are on supervised release. Uh, next slide, please. And this is our EM program. Another busy slide, but I wanted to make sure everybody got all the data that was available. Uh, we want to be as transparent as possible. Um, and any data we have, we'll be glad to share. Uh, the first column um, releases, those completed and pending release, APSCON, new arrests, and non compliance. Uh, the pending is a very big, uh, can we go back, please? The pending one, uh, the third column, you know, it's a, that's an important number not to lose track of because it skews the numbers. We have pending numbers. Uh, overall, those that are, are released, we're at a 71% uh, success rate on EM. Uh, if you look at 21-22, that 48%, right? That's because there's 38% still pending. So we're on track to get to um, hopefully, we could do better than the previous year. We're, we're on track to be in the 70s. So, um, if you look at the numbers, the APSCON rate per EM is, is pretty low. Um, you know, the numbers are there with the percentages. Uh, the new arrests are also down. So, we have downward trends, which is really good. Uh, and the compliant, the non compliance is 14%. Uh, those are the figures we have with EM. Um, next slide, please. please. So I, I just wanted to just um, uh, our CDP program is is in a different bureau. Um, I, I'm not going to speak at any detail on it. I just want to give uh, uh, we do have uh, electronic monitoring. We do have those that are going to court that are after adjudication. Um, the current number, if you go down to the, the next slide, please. Uh, I gave the current number in the first slide. It's 111, and th these are the numbers the last four years. Uh, if you see the numbers are, are downward trending, 2019, there was 3,800 total for the year, an average of 317 per month, uh, 2186, 1457, and then currently the year's only halfway, it's, it's 603, targeted to probably about 1200 if it, things continue. So just high level, what, what those numbers look like, um, that helps with, um, minors going to going to court, uh, going to school. So so it, they're out in the community with their families. Uh, you know we we do want uh, to not um, minimize the importance of minors being at home and going to school. So this program allows that. Uh, next next slide, please. And we have the GPS program. Um, those that are on AB 109 supervision, uh, we do have GPS for, for those cases. 
they're primarily uh, those that are 290 sex registrants. Um, those that are in adult felony probation, there's a required state mandate for an assessment tool to be administered, static 99R. Uh, mentioned the R because it was revised at some point. And uh, that's per penal code with a requirement. If those, that's, those that score over six have to be placed on, on GPS, uh, on felony probation supervision. These are all coordinated through the court. A couple items. Um, the court does have authority to place somebody on GPS and also take somebody off. Um, and that's that one first note is just related to static 99. Um, that defense, if they're 10 years free, they're, they're not eligible for rescoring. And, and it's a little more detailed than needed, but I wanted to make sure I, I cover that. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a high level AB 109 and felony. Uh, cases on GPS. So we have um, currently, if you go to the current uh, 176 on AB 109 GPS, and we have 41 that have that high static 99. Those are the percentages. Uh, the numbers have from 19 to now have gone down 302 to 235, the 205 to 217. Uh, well, actually, this year is a little bit more than last year. So those are current numbers. Those those individuals, if they're on felony probation, they're usually on for three or five years. That's why those numbers are consistent. And they're on AB 109. They're up, they're on about a one year uh, period. Those those are the slides. It's we could take those off. And I wanted to cover a couple things. Um, you know, our our EM again the. The focus is uh, on our pretrial EM and supervised release program. Uh, it, it's an option in lieu of custody. Um, we we do. It's the least restrictive. You know, I, we've heard some some comments, some concerns. Uh, individuals are allowed to work. They're allowed to to, to look for employment. Um, they're allowed to go to their medical appointments. You know, they're at home. They could change their address. They could go to appointments. They could go to grocery stores. You know, we have case case managers that are monitoring these cases, our pretrial folks. They're non-sworn, they're investigator aides and investigators. They do a great job. You know, cases come to us from court, they're referred. And, um, and with those, the, as we all know, in the court process, there's the DA, the PD, and the judge. These are all the great, great upon referrals. Uh, when an individual comes to us, uh, they're either enrolled quickly, either in court or at two locations. If they're at CRDF, there's an enrollment installer there or at Twin Towers. Uh, we have uh, remote offices. Um, individuals don't have to go in, check in, only if there's some issue with their device. A lot of it's telephonic. Uh, we have the capability of sending a technician to a, somebody's home to make an adjustment. Uh, so all those things are in place. We have staff that are doing the best they can to, to make sure people are successful. Um, you know, our interest is to make sure people complete, do what the court orders, and we're obligated to let the court know on violations and any kind of conditional, um, you know, noncompliance. We tell the court. The court ultimately makes the decision to remand, terminate. Um, we don't arrest folks uh, by our pretrial folks. You know, we send everything to court. Uh, it's been around for, for some time, electronic monitoring. Uh, I started back uh, in the early 90s, and the program was much larger at that time. Uh, we had about 2,000 individuals on electronic monitoring. Um, that was due to overcrowding. The jail pop was much larger. Uh, so things have changed. Uh, all those folks that the numbers we said, I know that was a lot of data. Uh, all those folks, they're in lieu of jail. Uh, those individuals have gone through the booking process, through court proceedings, and all along the way, release considerations are made by the court. Uh, folks are released on, uh, you know, uh, charges that could be cited out. Uh, every court appearance, uh, judges have authority to release owner recognizance. And these are folks where the court is place on electronic monitoring. And if, if it were not for this program, uh, it's likely they would be in custody. 
um, and we're supporting the gel reduction efforts. Uh, you know, that's part of our county mission. Uh, so it does serve a purpose. Uh, again, I'm always for effective programs, how to refine programs, how to improve programs. Uh, so I really look forward to taking a really closer look at, at the operations. And that's kind of the, the, the quick overview, high level. Um, Karen, do you wanna? Uh, thank you, Richard. Um, I think uh, you covered it. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions at this point. Well, thank you both for that presentation. Wendy, do you have any written or live public comments for this item? Thank you, Chair Carrillo, and thank you uh, for those really excellent presentations. I appreciate it. Uh, we received one written comment, which has already been attached to the agenda and sent to commissioners. And I'd like to invite members of the public who'd like to uh, make public comment on this item to raise your hand by clicking on the little raise your hand function, uh, or you can uh, dial star three if you're calling in. I'll give you just a moment to do so, but so far we don't have any hands raised. Okay, here we go. We'll start, uh, Jennifer, if you can put the timer up. We'll start with Mary Portillo. Uh, Mary, you are not yet unmuted, so give us a second. Are we doing the, thanks Jennifer. Are you able to unmute Mary, Janae? Okay, there we go, Mary, you have two minutes, you can begin. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as you know, my name is Mary and I'm calling on behalf of the juvenile supervisors. Um, you know, we, apparently, you know, the supervisors are unable to believe the lies that Karen Fletcher and the chief are telling the probation overnight commission. They said they involved the supervisors and managers when they decided to move youth from central to very J Juvenile Hall, that was a lie. Supervisors and directors found out about the move in the email the night before. Mary, I'm sorry to cutting you off. Can we wait for these public comments towards the end? We're talking about this specific topic right now about the electrical monitoring. If, unless you have something to say about this specific topic, I would love to hear what you have to say, but you, you have to wait until towards the end of the, of the meeting. There's actually an agenda item specifically about the move to Central um, coming up. Shortly, so uh, did, you, did you have any comments about the electronic monitoring? I'll wait until the you, okay. uh, get you? the agenda. Okay. Um, anybody else who wants to make a comment on the electronic monitoring reports? I don't see any hands, uh, Chair Carrillo. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Wendy. Commissioners, do we have any questions or comments on this item? And I see a hand. Uh, Commissioner Dupuis, you're up. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, and I want to apologize in advance if there's a bit of a delay. I think my internet is a bit wonky, so bear with me. Um, thank you, Alicia and um, Mr. Kiron. I think I'm pronouncing that right for these presentations. The information you provided was really helpful um, and, of course, left me with some questions. So, my first question, I think, is for. Um, Alicia, you had mentioned that the judges recommend electronic monitoring at Lancaster at 92% of the time. Um, and is are we trying to understand, do we know kind of why that is? Or are you trying to understand whether or not probation recommends it? And that's what has to do with the high percentage. I'm just trying to get a little clarity around that. Yeah, so I don't know why that is. I do think that um, understanding whether, so probation through the CCAT um, may make a recommendation, right? It, may, they, it comes out with a risk score and then they may make a recommendation in terms of um, electronic monitoring. I'm not sure if that's what happens or if the court is the one that then imposes electronic monitoring on top of the, you know, re regular supervision that's required by that um, SRP program. Thank you for that. And then um, I was also interested in um, Mr. Kiron. I think I'm, please correct me if I'm mispronouncing your name, but. You're fine. Thank you. I'm fine. Okay, great. The, um, 
you, you mentioned that there has been an update so there's no more fees associated with like the alcohol testing or any of the electronic monitoring but the client agreement says it is there an updated client agreement that we could have access to that reflects the current changes sure sure i, I definitely could, could, could pull a more updated one and um it, that looked like that might have been a sheriff release one so i could get a more updated one Most okay that would be really helpful um and then you know i saw there was some um in the data the failure to appear was um, a high percentage of folks. Do we have a sense of um, why folks fail to appear? And uh, a couple, I'll answer it a couple ways. Um, every every court event, there's a reminder, uh, either telephonically, a text, um, and and this has been a, a concern with all court appearances. You know, even if a person's not on electronic monitoring or supervised release, uh, there is a pretty high uh, warrant issuance rate from the court, misdemeanor felony cases. Uh, we're doing, we're taking a closer look at it. It's a concern of ours. If that, if we can improve that number, uh, you know, the overall non-compliance would would go down like in, almost in half. Uh, so, so we're taking a look at it. Yeah, because my concern is that people are being criminalized for lack of access to resources. Right and like, you know, if you don't have the means to appear, what happens, right? And should that really be something that you're penalized for, or should we attempt to make accommodations for folks who are trying to um, comply, so to speak, but are have other barriers? Uh, I really appreciated all the recommendations that Alicia offered, and I would encourage us actually to accept all of them. And look into all of the things that um, she has questions about or suggestions for. Uh, I'd be interested in in helping um, facilitate that process as well. So I wanted just to hear um, from you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Cajeron, if we if that's something that we can can do. Can we like follow up specifically on the um, questions and requests and recommendations that? Uh, Ms. Verani has proposed and see how we can work through those. Sure, absolutely. Um, again, you know, we want effective programs and we would, you know, I, I hearing them for the first time, the recommendations would definitely, okay. I, I welcome an offline um, or a future meeting. That would be great. great. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner uh, Sam Lewis, you're up. Thank you, Chair Carrillo. Uh, so, one, uh, definitely my colleague, uh, Deputy uh, Dupree, uh, answered one as, as far as the the, the testing uh, and fines uh, for that. So, that answers that. Uh, I have two questions, basically. One, there's a risk assessment uh, in determining who should be on a, a, a electronic monitoring. Is there a needs assessment in order for, and we made this recommendation uh, back in 2020 to the judicial council when considering electronic monitoring that in addition to any type of risk assessment, there should be a needs assessment. Is there a needs assessment that's in place to, to determine if a person needs childcare, transportation, or any of those things in order for them to be able to meet their requirements? I wonder just more concisely, is there a needs assessment that, that's done? Yes, there, there is one uh, with the supervised release program. Uh, we've implemented the, the CCAT, it's the criminal court assessment tool, and they do identify uh, uh, needs, and that's attached to, that's how we identify the connection of Project 180 uh, on the supervised release. Okay, and then my other question is, uh, the time frame that's, that's required for seeking employment, Again, with the needs assessment, are the individuals that are required to find employment in a specific uh, amount of time connected to resources that will assist them with finding employment? Yeah, I'll be glad to take a look at that, Mr. Lewis, um, and, and the timeframes. And, and there's our, our, we're very flexible with our case managers. You know, it, it's about w working the schedule out to where they're allowed. So, so, you know, what's reasonable, of course, you know, uh, but I think employment's critical, and we'll definitely take a look at that. We, uh, the, uh, we're, to, we're referring to that specified number 
that was cited. I'll, I'll take, take, definitely take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lewis. Commissioner Nong, you're up. Thank you. I want to um, <clears throat> thank everyone for their presentations. And of course, Commissioner Dupree and Lewis covered a bunch of my questions um, as, as well. But I just have one quick question, which is for the list of conditions for the programs. I know that there's a contract with a private <clears throat> provider to provide those. And so the list of conditions, including specifically the search and seizure condition, who decides on that condition and the other ones? Is it the contractor? Is it probation? Is it the judge? Who is that? Sorry about that. That one on conditions, that I think that's an old document and that's from the sheriff release program. So I need me to take a look at those and get more revised ones. Those that are court ordered, uh, the conditions on there. And it may be reflective in, in the court docket as somebody's placed on. So we'll definitely get those clarified. And if I can just weigh in really quickly, because I think there was probably a little confusion. Some of the requirements like the search and seizure and the alcohol testing, I took directly from probation's manual. Um, so it's not from the sheriff's department. It is from the, the EMP manual. I'll definitely take a look at it. Thank you. Commissioner Garcia Lace. Thank you. Um, I have way too many questions to ask and thoughts to share now, um, particularly with that long but compelling list of recommendations from uh, Professor Arani. So, um, what I'd like to think through with the other commissioners is next steps. Um, so this, I believe, would fall under the Program and Services Committee uh, scope of work. So perhaps what we need next is to refer this issue to that committee um, and um, set up some follow-up meetings um, with both of our very capable presenters. I'd also like to bring in the district attorney's office. Um, I think a lot of this should be done in partnership with the DAs because they're the ones who are going to be asking uh, the courts more, I think, at least in the adult context than probation uh, for electronic monitoring. Um, I am concerned that what a program that is well intentioned to avoid jail um, is actually being done in addition to jail, but rather in lieu of offering people release on their own recognizance. Um, I also know the pretrial is, you know, it's been declared unconstitutional, yet nothing has replaced it, uh, money bail, et cetera. So the, this whole system is is in the midst of some some really fundamental changes, I think. Um, so I, I, that's my recommendation is, is we refer the uh, program and services committee to try to put all those pieces together and figure out what the POC can do and come back with a series of uh, recommendations to the commission as a whole. Um, before I put that forward as a motion, though, I'd like to hear if anybody has any other thoughts on how we should move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia Lays. I, um, I would be in support of that move. I just am concerned, like after hearing the list of recommendations, I feel like they're all important to consider. Um, even if like we can easily get the information for some of them or things have changed and I just don't want to delay the process. So I'm wondering how we can, um, make sure that we address this appropriately within committee, but also, you know, don't take a too much time or, you know, trying to move forward. I, I'm open to suggestions about that. I just want to highlight that as a, as, as something that I'm thinking about. When you say too long, are you thinking two months or a year, or what, what would be too long? <laughs> well, I guess I just um, don't want us to be like, oh, let's have a couple meetings to review the recommendations, then add some more, and then this before we, you know, um, get them kind of ad addressed. I, I recognize that we need to talk through what's possible from our end, but seeing as Mr. Caron and um, I, I'm assuming uh, Ms. Virani both um, are willing to come to the to the table 
um, maybe there is some way to put into the motion some um, measure of expediency around it. Um, you know, and this is me just thinking off the top of my head right now. So I think that's a good point. And perhaps the way to handle it is we have, we set a date to come back by that soon. And uh, the committee comes back with what can we do in the short term? What is their consensus around? What are the easy ones? And maybe we act quickly on those. Um, and then we recognize that some of these are going to require significantly more time, um, either because they will take more work, they involve more actors, they need more research, um, but th th we'll just take more time when we need to. Let me jump in real quick. Um, Ms. Ronnie, do you have the list of uh, recommendations? I know we, I, I didn't, I didn't get them all down, but it sounds like there's double digits. <laughs> yes, I so can. If, I'm happy to send them to you all. I think if we're going to, if there's going to be a motion, we should definitely not use my memory or maybe even the commissioner's memories, but have an actual list. Um, I'm not sure, Sean, or I'm not sure who's into the motion, but if we're going to ref refer to uh, the list, the list should definitely um, be made available. Um, I actually do have a list. Uh, I apparently was not shared with all commissioners, so uh, we will have a list to work from. Thank you. And before we, before there's a motion, if there is going to be a motion, but it sounds like there is, uh, Mr. Guidon, if you're, if you're still available, see your camera's off, and then I'll get to you, um, Commissioner. I, I, got a, I got a question, and maybe just for clarification. Did you say you were working with this, with this item here, the EM, since early 90s? Um, yeah, so this is my 32nd year, and, and uh, about the late 80s and 90s, I worked uh, pretrial services. Got it. Okay, that helps. Um, so the question is, maybe I might need some more clarification, but did you say you were surprised to hear of Ms. Verani's list of, of issues that, that, she, that she is, I suppose, requesting us to look into these recommendations? No, 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 I, no I just I hadn't seen them before. Okay, is, is, there, is there a method within the probation department to look over um, any flaws, any problems, and do any internal correcting? Uh, absolutely, you know, we're, we, again, we want programs that are effective. You know, I have a leadership team, a management team. We'll be glad to take a look at it and, and correct and improve the, the process. And I, and I appreciate you wanting to look into it, but has there been, is there ever uh, a timetable uh, a time in the year where you internally say, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? Uh, you know, we, we have leadership team meetings. Um, you know, it, it's, um, I'll take a look at uh, pretrial, um, but there's plenty, plenty of opportunity to, to make improvement. And the question is, has there been? I have to check. Um, in the 30 you know, programs are revised, are revised. Um, like again, supervised release started, it's only been two years. Uh, now's a good time to take a look at supervised release, and there's always revisions to policy, and um, we, we do that, you know, we do that as policies come up, but again, it's time for the supervised release. It's been, again, two years now, so uh, I'll definitely take a look at that. Thank you, and I just want to remind the commissioners that any questions that will be on the record should be either handled now, I think, um, moving into either a closed door subcommittee uh, as a follow up is great, but I think that there's some questions that maybe we can ask now as well. And I see it, uh, Commissioner Nong, your hand is up as well. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> support the proposed motions being recommended, especially um, both the subsequent meetings and the this designated timeline. I just wanted to make a request that even their meetings as much as possible, especially probation's responses, including any obstacles identified, <clears throat> any possible alternatives be put in writing as much as possible, because I just think it's important that the public be kept um, in the loop about these. Because I also think, and also that when these discussions happen, I understand um, obviously Professor Verani and probation and the DAs, but also making sure that 
um, those who have experienced EM, those who have, um, and those from the community also, their voices and input are, are involved as well. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other commissioners want to chime in? Okay, I don't see any hearing nothing. I think we're we're ready for me to make the motion I suggested. Um, so I'm going to add to it also. Uh, so first, uh, I move that we direct. Uh, commission staff to work with probation to request all of the information and data that Professor Bayani requested, and that we also request that same information um, for electronic monitoring of juveniles for, for the four different categories of programs that um, Mr. Uh, Director Garon talked about. Uh, the second part is that we then refer this issue to the Program and Services Committee uh, to uh, investigate um, the particular recommendations we've heard today to come back in a month to the commission with a report on uh, the progress of the meeting so far and then again as necessary. You get a second on that? I second it, Commissioner Jackson. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Garcia Lays and seconded by Vice Chair Jackson. And we'll open it up for discussion now before we take a vote. So at this point now, either chime in or raise your hand and I'll look at the participation board. Okay, looks like there's no discussion on this item. Um, Wendy, can we get a vote? Yes, I'm if it's okay with you, I'll read what I wrote down from what Commissioner Garcia Lays said, which is uh, that it's a 2 part motion to direct the POC staff to request all the data requests that are included among uh, Professor Verani's uh, recommendations, including uh, juvenile data for juveniles on electronic monitoring and the other uh, 3 categories. Uh, and then second, to refer to the programs and services committee to investigate the recommendations return in 1 month uh, to the POC with the results of that investigation. And then again, as necessary, does that sound right? Commissioner Garcia Lays. That okay, great. I'm going to call the roll uh, and please unmute yourself and respond. Uh, yes, no, or abstain. We'll start with commissioner Canales. Yes, commissioner Dupuy. Yes. Commissioner Garcia Lays. Yes. Commissioner Jackson. Aye. Commissioner Lewis, I believe had to step off the meeting, uh, but I believe he is returning. I will um, indicate in the minutes when he returns. Commissioner Meredith. Aye. Commissioner Nong. Yes. Commissioner Yamashiro. Yes. Chair Carrillo. Yes. The motion passes unanimously. Thanks everyone. And thanks again for those presentations. We are moving on now to item number four. Item number four is for us to discuss and take appropriate action on services provided by Los Angeles Probation Department Special Enforcement Operation Unit, SEO. We heard a report from Deputy Director Howard Wong at our last meeting about this. Since time was short, we did not have a, a chance to fully get into, the, into his presentation or ask questions on the SEO unit. His April 14th presentation on SEO has been attached to the agenda as a reference and today we will give a brief recap about the SEO unit and update the commission on the, per, on the department's progress in creating a taser usage policy. Mr. Wong, please proceed with your updates. Thank you, commission. Uh, thank you for the invitation to come back to do a little deeper dive into uh, SEO. Uh, there is actually a PowerPoint. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. For this update, next slide. Thank you. So SEO. Oh, go back one, please. There you go. SEO um, started back in ninety nine two thousand. Since that time, there has been twenty academies. There's approximately ninety five staff in that unit now, and it's a special recruitment process, right? So it's not just a 
uh, a unit that you can just sign up for. It's actually a special recruitment process since arming is voluntary in this department. So there, a part of that is the orientation, a background check, a medical psychological clearance, and then after that, it's the SEO Academy. All right, the Academy is six weeks, 240 hours, and the Sheriff Department conducts the PC 832 piece for us. Uh, next slide, please. And here are just some of the classes um, that our folks go through who are in the SEO Academy, implicit bias, tactical communications, mental health awareness, CPR first aid, value-based decision-making. Uh, we do take the EVOC class, that's the emergency vehicle operation class uh, with the San Bernardino Sheriffs. Um, a lot, lot of classes, right? And like I said, the uh, the firearm piece is done by um, the Sheriff's Department. This is just a pretty good smattering of the classes that are covered in that uh, six-week academy. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the questions was regarding operation planning. So the um, SEO is tasked with compliance checks, and this is for uh, AB 109ers, adult probationers, Prop 63 folks. We have folks that work task forces and uh, with CLEAR out of LEPD. So on a typical compliance check operation, um, there is an investigating officer, which is one of our DPOs at SEO. Um, they use PGIS to actually look at uh, the folks under our jurisdiction in this certain area that they will be uh, doing compliance checks on, right? We are looking at, like I said, AB 109ers, the PSPs, formal probation, Prop 63. Sometimes our placement folks out of juvenile, they are looking for uh, somebody on a warrant. So we'll include other, other locations in these compliance checks. Next slide, please. The uh, investigating officer will, will, uh, will compile an uh, operation plan, which is uh, approved by reviewing it and approved by that team supervisor. Supervisor approves it. It goes to the director level for review and approval. Um, and then the operation, which I'll explain the next slide, uh, occurs. The DPOs, uh, the investigating DPO will conduct the uh, the administrative pieces after that operation, which is informing the case carrying DPO of any actions, anything found, um, updating our systems and conducting and submitting any kind of court report that's needed. And there is a recap form um, post operation. Next slide, please. All right, a lot of systems they check, um, eight to 10 systems for each location. Uh, Ellie Claire is one of the big ones, right? This is a, a conflict clearing house where other law enforcement folks might be in the same general area during the operation for the specific location or other officers from different jurisdictions are looking at this specific uh, individual. Um, we look at DMV booking, firearm inquiry, uh, cheers, right, for criminal history, um, Google Maps for a picture of that house or that location we uh, that the team will be um, conducting a compliance check on. A lot of systems, um, they do do a last minute check be the day before that operation. There are times where the person we are doing compliance check on has been arrested or uh, on a warrant or something that uh, takes them out of that op. Next picture, uh, next slide please. All right, so the basics of the compliance check, and this is a general overview. Usually our dedicated SEO teams will have about six to eight DPOs. Um, each of them will have uh, a predetermined a, a specific responsibility for each of the locations. So the teams do brief before they go to each location. Um, the investigating officer conducts a door knock, right? It notifies the folks inside, hey, this is probation, we had to do a compliance check. Um, before we do anything else, there's always a safety suite, right? Meaning that we ask the occupants to come outside. Is there anybody else in, in the house, right? And safe, safety suite is for anything that's out there, contraband, anybody hiding inside the house, 
there are times where, hey, there's no one here. Uh, we open a door and someone pops out. All right, so safety check first. Once the safety check is completed and it's called for, then the compliance check will occur. Uh, they are looking at the client's living area and any common areas, uh, kitchen, restrooms, living rooms, garages, where they might have access to. And then really important is the bullet four. So prior to finishing up on that specific location, the investigating officer and the supervisor will have a conversation with the client and the occupants of the house saying, hey, um, you know, if, if nothing was found, I, I believe one of the commissioners brought this up um, on my last presentation was, uh, do we do a temperature check, right? If nothing is found, hey, good job, keep up the good work. We'll, we'll let, make sure we'll let your DPO know, right? If if it's good. Or we have times where the, that client that we're, we were looking at never told the, the person they're staying with that they're subject to search and seizure. So that comes as a surprise as probation is knocking on that door, right? Saying, hey, this person never told me that you guys can just come in you know, uh, and, and do a compliance check. So there's a conversation with that, with that IO, with the supervisor and the occupants of the house, including the client before we leave that location. Next slide, please. And here are some updated stats from January, 2021 through April, 2022. The drug, little type, okay. Drug seizure, please, uh, uh, peace. This was brought up um, during, by somebody, one of the commissioners during the last presentation, is that marijuana? Yes, we understand that marijuana law has passed, but these, and it has been confirmed, that quantity is usually from illegal grow farms and pot dispensaries that, um, that they did an operation on or a joint operation on. That's why you see marijuana in there. It's that large quantity from the grow houses, from the, the legal dispensaries. So drug seizures, right? you got marijuana, cocaine, meth, and heroin. Uh, one of the, uh, actually the searches didn't come through. So they've conducted 16,768 searches, right? Since January, 2021, firearm seizures. Here's another big one. They, they recover a lot of firearms, handguns, right? 1580. Seven and long guns, which is your ARs or your shotguns, uh, 152. So they, they do recover a lot of firearms uh, during the compliance checks. Uh, the warrants enforced are in 1,098. And arrest, they do arrest people, majority of adults, uh, 3,038 since uh, January 2021. Next slide, please. Um, there's a question regarding utilization of SEO in uh, the juvenile halls. So our canines do help out in the juvenile halls with narcotic and electronic support and searches, right, for, for the living units. Uh, some of our staff provide transports and security escorts. And uh, since deployment, we've been providing supplemental staffing for the units and movements. Next slide, please. Tasers. So the training plan and the draft policy was just completed as a draft. Um, POC OIG, uh, you will get a copy of that draft pretty soon. And internally, we're working with our ER and labor in our policy process as it goes through uh, that publishing process with our policies. A little something that I want to bring up is. The way the motion passed was that the OIG and POC had uh, was provided with the review of our policy and training plan, the draft portion, before we can cut the purchase order for to the vendor for the devices and training. So, because of that, uh, that motion, we the the draft policy. Chances are we'll be updated once we can cut the purchase order and actually talk to the vendor on training. So what we have now is a pretty solid draft, but there might be some revisions once we get the training actually completed and certified by uh, from our staff. Next slide, please. And that's it for the uh, general updates on this SEO piece. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wong.
Um, Wendy, do we have any written or live public comments for this item? I would like to encourage folks to uh, use your hand function and press on the three little dots at the bottom of your page, uh, open the participant window and then click on the little hand at the bottom. Or if you're calling in, you can dial star three on your phone and it will raise your hand for us. Um, we, Janae, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe we had any written public comment about this item. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, Wendy. And, and I don't, sorry, go ahead. And I was just going to let everyone know that our Facebook live stream is down right now. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay, uh, we will have a recording of the video from WebEx that will be posted afterwards. I think I've stalled uh, long enough here, Chair Carrillo, and I don't see any hands. So I think we can move past public comment. Thank you, Wendy. I see some hands here. Commissioner Yamashiro, you're up. Thank you. Um, so. Uh, Officer Wong, uh, or um, I'm sorry, I don't know how I should address you um, other than Mr. Wong. Um, <laughs> it's okay. okay. That's fine. What, 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 how would you prefer me to address you? I'm just, you can call me Howard, Mr. Wong. That doesn't really okay. matter. Mr. Wong, so I have a question for you. So I, I, in your PowerPoint, and forgive me if I, if I, if I, if I missed it, but it, it, you indicated that the supervising DPO is involved in the initial kind of plan to, to do a compliance check. Is that, is that correct? No, not the supervising DPL record. Okay, so, well, so the so in the first in the in on page five of your PowerPoint on the first bullet it says this, the uh, the SDPO reviews and approves the operation, and I'm so I'm just kind of curious about like if you are going to conduct an operation the S SDPO is is that not the the probationer's supervising officer? Correct. So the supervising DPL is actually the SEO supervisor. So the case carrying DPO is the DPO record and they are not involved. So when you say they're not involved, are you saying that the the the, as the supervising DPO is not involved in any facet of a of a plan to conduct a compliance check or the compliance check itself? Correct. And they're, they're not on scene during the compliance check. The, the case carrying DPO, right? Right. Yeah. The yeah, person who's not responsible for the, supervising the, the probationer. Right. Okay, so so they're not involved. So I'm just curious, like, if it is 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 this unit conducting compliance checks uh, on their own accord, or is it based? I mean, if if the if the supervising DPO is not involved, I mean, that is to say, the 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 DPO who's responsible for the oversight of the probationer is not involved in the planning, nor is is present for the compliance check nor is pro then they're not providing any information to the team um, prior to a compliance check. Um, am I understanding that correctly? Are those three assumptions correct? So it's both ways. So yes on the first and no on this and, and on the second is uh, that supervising DPO, the DPO record can say, can let us know and say, hey, can you go check on this person for my caseload? And do a compliance check on them. So we get those two. Okay. So, like, what what would you say would be the percentage of the instances where a compliance check is being conducted, and it is being done without the prompt by the probationer's uh, DPO of record? I'm gonna guess me about eighty percent of the time, twenty percent of the time they are asking us to do a compliance check on their client, where the other eighty percent is based on crime trends or uh, what we are looking for in the specific area and who has and where the jurisdiction is. So we have jurisdiction in San Gabriel Valley and we're going to hit Temple, right? We pull up who's on probation in this area and th th that's what we're looking at for compliance checks. Right. So, I mean, um, ha ha I'm just curious. I mean, it strikes me as odd that arguably the individual in the probation department who had would have the most information about the probationer who is being subjected to the compliance check in only 20 percent of the time that person is 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 part of the team um it, it seems both elevating the risk because you're going in with less information but also enabling this unit to conduct checks that may or may not be necessary. Um, any thoughts about why the department would choose to 
operate 80% of the time without any insight from the uh, the deputy probation officer of record? So uh, all the uh, which slide is this on slide six, right? One of the things that the, our details check from SEO before they do any kind of uh, compliance check is our app system and our PCMS system, which is our case management database, right? So whatever information that the, the case care and DPO, it is documented in our databases. So that those chronos are reviewed, right? Right, but I mean, you would think that you know, like, right? The if the, if there's there's twenty percent of the time where the where the DPO of record is like, hey, we need to check on this guy. There's something going on. Whatever that information is based on. Uh -huh. But eighty percent of the time, it has it has absolutely nothing to do with the individual at the department who is closest to the person who's being subjected to the compliance check. Right. right. So some right. Of, correct. So some of the history that goes back before my time is when the some of these DPOs were involved. Okay. The DPOs will, I'm just gonna throw it out there, will call the DPO, call the clients and say, hey, uh, there's gonna be a compliance check, right? And so, for whatever reason, uh, contraband's not there anymore. So it's, 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 it just happens sometimes like that. Right. But it would seem okay. Well, I mean, I, I, you get you get what I'm saying, right? Is like it seems like you 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 may not have to do as many compliance checks in this unit um, if you were consulting with the the officer who was most most close. And it also seems to me that that um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about this. It'll be my last uh, kind of comment and question. Um, to, ha to leave the, the you know one would hope that the probationers are developing a relationship with their with their uh, officer of record. Right, that's ideally from a rehabilitative standpoint, we would hope that that would be part and part of the of the of the approach to to getting people off of probation successfully um, to have a, an armed unit rolling into a house um, without any accountability between the, the, the supervising or the rather the, uh, the the DPO of record and not the DPO record being not even a part of the actual compliance check itself. Um, any thoughts to. To why, why that you think that is the optimal way of doing it? Their conditions of probation, their conditions of supervision from CDCR, right? Is search and seizure uh, 24 hours a day with or without a warrant from law enforcement, right? Right. Uh, I would rather our deputies who know that tomorrow the case candy pill will be coming, uh, we have that relationship with the probationers, right? Whereas, I, uh, Law for regular law enforcement without the info, without any contact, uh, does that compliance check? So right. I would well, rather. I guess I, let me let me. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I mean, I just this to to just clarify what I'm suggesting is is that you may have been developing a good relationship and rapport with a probationer, uh, and through and without any request whatsoever. I'm saying as a as a as the as the um, officer of record, I I would have been developing rapport, developing a relationship, and unbeknownst to me, uh, your team rolls in and tosses my clients home, um, you know, at, at two o'clock in the morning or whatever it is you guys decide to go to do that. Um, that seems to erode the kind of relationship that we're trying to develop needlessly. Like I'm not suggesting in any way we put people at risk needlessly, but I also think it just, it just doesn't seem, it seems, Counterintuitive to me that the department would disconnect the 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 uh, investigator or rather the officer of record from this team and the need to do these types of of uh, compliance checks. I, 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 I understand what you're saying. So, and Mr. Yamashiro, if I might, um, certainly the case carrying officer, when going over the conditions of probation with a client, explains to them the possibility of these compliance checks. And as Mr. Wong uh, outlined, the reasons why we do that. And certainly, you know, police officers uh, from local jurisdictions have the legal right based on that search and seizure clause to go in without probation. Uh, to do those searches, and we don't particularly support that. We want probation to do them. We want to make sure that our clients are treated in a way that is respectful. We don't go in and toss a house. Um, we are very systematic about what we do when we're in the house because 
those officers in SEO know for certain that as they leave there, when a regular case carrying probation officer who is assigned to that case has to engage with that person, they want to make sure that their colleague is uh, protected as well. And so, you know, if if there is some indication out in the community that that looks any different, I would I would love to to hear that. But our our modus operandi is certainly not to go in and toss a house. No, I understand that, but I, I guess what I would say is just because you, I mean, the, 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 our clients, the, the probationers are, are given a, a hundreds of admonishments from the time they, they are placed on probation. They, they're, they're, the, the courts admonish them uh, the same search and seizure conditions. That's terms and conditions of probation. They say that, articulate that on the record. So everybody knows that. So I'm not disputing whether or not anyone has the right. It's just a question of just because you can doesn't necessarily mean that you should. And it seems like like it, uh, you have the resources to coordinate and work with the officer who is developing rapport and relationship with the probationer. It seems, I don't know, it just seems strange that that there wouldn't be closer coordination or frankly that 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 the supervising officer or rather the officer of record is not present when the searches occur. Thank you, Commissioner Yamashiro. Um, Commissioner Meredith, you're up. Yeah, I'm just going to come in. I understand where Commissioner Yamashiro is coming from as far as her de building, developing the rapport with the client, but I also understand the tactical necessity sometimes of having to do these compliance checks. Law enforcement does it on a regular basis, most often without probation for a variety of tactical reasons. Now, I also know that, um, I think it's SEOU, that come like Halloween and certain things like that, they will go out and do compliance checks on the sex offenders just prior to Halloween as a preemptive strike, if you will. So, I mean, I understand there's two sides of the story and there's balance in there. Um, and I think we need to look at trying to find that balance. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dupuy, you're up. Um, thank you. Uh, um, and thank you, Commissioner Yamashiro for asking those questions because they brought up some more questions for me, honestly, um, about compliance checks and the process um, in general. And it, forgive me if I miss this, but I'm going back. I'm kind of stuck on this like 80% of the time. We Did I hear this correctly? I guess is there's a crime spike in an area. And then we check out who in the area is currently on supervision. And then they check the... I don't. I, I guess I got caught up in that explanation, and I was looking for some clarification about the process. It's just like crime spike happens. We go in and decide to do compliance checks on anyone who's eligible to have them done in a particular community, or how does that go? So, uh, so here's an example. There might be uh, in a certain area uh, a crime trend for stolen for stolen cars, right? For for stolen cars. So the, the teams would check pages to see, hey, in this area, how many, which probation uh, clients have a history of stealing cars, right? That are search, subject to search and seizure. So th they will, for that day, their locations are these six to 10 uh, probationers, right? AB 109ers, former probationers, that have a history or a current crime of stealing cars. So, so for that day, that op is specific location uh, where that trend is, and these are the folks that have that history of X crime, if that makes sense. That does make sense. Thank you for that clarification. I'm wondering, does that actually, I mean, I'm wondering how much many times that's like a successful approach to the goal of addressing an increase in like car theft in the area. Um, do you guys collect information or data on on that? Like whether the probationers you end up searching are actually related to the crime spike that caused the search to begin with? Uh, some that data sometimes is more um, available if it was a task force operation. Right, 
where uh, it's documented, they know what they're looking for or looking at. Um, for us, if you go in, we might find st stolen car parts. There was one recently was a bunch of catalytic converters, right? That, that was recovered. But along with that is we, we went and we found a bunch of guns, right? Which had nothing to do with stolen cars, but we found a bunch of guns and dope. So it's hard to correlate unless it's a task force operation where we are targeting this and this is what we got. And I, I appreciate the data again on um, that you guys present. I always, as many know, I'm a big fan of data um, when it's clear. And I feel like a lot of the information you've provided is clear. Um, but have you, were you, did you present on how, what percentage of time nothing comes up? Like, I know there was like, here's how many drugs we found. Here's the guns we found. But how often is it where nothing is found where the compliance checks was clean there is yeah. a good percentage of that because okay. uh that i would need to get back to you with yeah but i know i've seen the ops plans i've seen the, some of the, the degrees where you know the the client was good there was nothing found they're in compliance and that's what we report back to the uh, case care and dpo okay thank you for answering those questions mr oh. Wong. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, before I call on you, uh, Commissioner Garcia Lee, let me ask Mr. Holland a couple of questions. Um, I, I was recently at Barry J, and and I, I asked the person who was escorting me who that was under under a shaded tree, sort of maybe about a hundred yards from the movement that was going on at the time, which was uh, units were going to school, and they they told me it was um, it was the units that we're referring to now. It, can you? Me if there is any specific training that this that these units have, or 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 um, or are requested to turn on while they're inside the juvenile facilities. A specific training like tactical communications, de-escalation, mental health awareness. All of the above. I just think that you know, and more specifically, Mr. Wong. What it what it felt like to me because they stood out so much. It, they seemed to be like flat out law enforcement. So that was sort of what caught my attention. And it turns out it was this uh, SEO unit. And I was wondering, are they there, um, especially from the distance that they were standing, to de-escalate a situation if something would, 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 was going to happen, or are there were they there to? Um, I mean, I know every situation is different, so I don't want to you know I'm getting too broad here. But is, is there presence in, in, in a situation like that more of why they're there? Were they called in? Are they called in? Can you give me an idea why they would even show up? SEO, um, it's probably, I'm going to say presence. I mean, Karen's on the phone, online. It's presence. And these folks, they, they do not carry cases, right? They're not case low care and DPOs. So if needed, we can say, hey, I need all SEO at X location now. Right, and usually they drop what they're doing and show up to either be a presence, assist, or or, or whatever. Just because of the fact that they don't have caseload responsibility, where you know I have to see this client or I have to do this court report, right? So we can deploy them pretty readily when when it's needed. So if it's for Barry J, it's probably for presence because staffing issues, all kinds of stuff. And, and Karen, please weigh in. If I miss anything like that regarding deployments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so they were part of the general deployment of field staff into the institutions due to the staffing levels. And so they rotated uh, some uh, at some point were assigned in units. This particular instance that I think you're referring to probably was during um, uh, a time where we had a significant uh, spike in the number of incidents that were happening with youth on youth violence. We were having a significant number of incidents occurring in our schools, um, which many teachers felt as though they needed uh, additional assistance. We had the Department of Justice attorneys on site as well who were supportive of having our SEO staff present just for the mere fact of standing by just to make sure that we could get kids into the classrooms. Many of the fights were happening as soon as we'd get a youth or a group of youth, uh, a unit into a classroom, they would run out and fight with each other. And so this was more of a presence uh, to make sure that if anything escalated, 
uh, that we could have extra bodies on site to be able to respond. Is, was there is there a reason why they would be so far away from from the youth? Yeah, I think the approach was they weren't going to uh, be in the units unless necessary. Uh, we had quite a few of our SEO staff out there um, and they were watching from afar some of those movements out of the units. And, and I know of at least one situation where uh, a fight started to occur, occur then they uh, came closer to intervene. There were instances where they came closer and the youth stopped, so they didn't have to physically intervene in anything. The youth saw that there were enough staff present to be able to handle the situation. Um, so uh, that was uh, deliberate on our part. Okay, thank you. And one last thing before I pass it on to my, my colleague, Mr. Garcia Lees. Mr. Wong, you know, I, I try, not, try not to take these, these topics personally, but Piggybacking off of Commissioner Yamashir and Commissioner Dupuy, you know, as many of you know, and I'm not sure if you know or not, Mr. Wong, but I was wrongfully convicted many, many years ago. And to hear of this, of this really very broad and open uh, ability that probation has to go after, um, as you said, someone who has priors with stealing cars, or the next time it can be someone of color, or the next time it can be uh, the fact that it was a man or a woman, like on and on. Um, not only to disturb people um, who are already, uh, you know, on your list, but to almost like softly accuse them of possibly being involved. Um, and as you said, that there might have been um, catalytic converters or, or other things that are that are triggering that might, you know, that maybe it's not the sus suspect you were looking for, but maybe now you do have a suspect that you're that you've um, that you've have in your in your in your net here. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right uh, place to, or maybe directly to you, Mr. Wong, but do you think that there's anything wrong with that, of having that type of ability to, to um, I don't know, I'm not sure if it's to, it's to go into people's homes or, or has, has this process worked? Is it, I mean, commissioners can maybe anyone help me here. I know Mr. Uh, Yamashiro did a great job of this already, but, and I'm maybe trying to add a little personal touch, touch to this, but I'm just concerned that this that this policy is is really opening the door to possibly um, you know, arresting the wrong person or possibly um, compounding a problem for someone that that has nothing to do with something. So anything that you can shed light on this would be helpful. Sure, and, and we don't arrest the wrong people, right? And I just want to put it out there. I mean, if we're in a compliance check situation and uh, like on one of my stats right these folks found close to 2,000 guns right in homes or residents of folks who are prohibited from having guns now, 2,000 guns is a lot of guns right and if this person it's I heard of instances where it's found in the bed in their closet under their pillows that person is going to be arrested on a violation right and, and, I mean, the wrong person piece, not to my knowledge, that's ever occurred, right? It's, we found something and it's tied to this person, right? And this person's on probation with these conditions that, or it's a new crime, or it's a task force piece. And, and like Chief Fletcher said, we don't go in, and I know, I've been out there with these folks. We don't go in tossing houses. It's respectful. There's a lot of communication, right? And there is a debrief with that occupant and the probationer, right? It's and it's I would rather our folks do it than local law enforcement do it, right? Because we know that person I will see again. They'll see my counterparts or the case carrying DPL the next week or so, right? We don't get those kind of complaints. So yeah, we're really systematic and tactical when we approach these things. It's not just you know a shotgun approach by far. And Chair Correa, we probation does not arrest on new criminal conduct. We would call local law enforcement to come in. Um, as Mr. Wong said, uh, any arrest that probation would make would be uh, specific to a violation of probation um, and then appearing in court within 48 hours. Um, so that, that new case, uh, they would investigate and determine whether or not it was the right person. Thank you both. Commissioner Garcia-Lazra. 
Thanks. Um, so let me say first, this sort of compliance check uh, is definitely one of the most dangerous um, operations that I think anybody in our department could engage in. Um, and getting guns off the street, I think, is one of the most noble things that this department can accomplish. So um, those are, I mean, it just deserves a lot of praise. Um, for uh, Chair Carrillo, what I'm the way I'm thinking about this is if probation is in lieu of incarceration, then, you know, the, the, the search by probation of your house is a lot less invasive than the searches you go through when you're in jail or prison. Um, and so in that way, it's also laudable. Um, but it is a little bit more complicated maybe uh, than we're hearing. I mean, I have had clients where there are multiple, you know, late adolescents living in the house, all brothers or cousins. Three of them are on probation, maybe one of them has a gun. All three of them end up having their probation violated, right? So there, there are, it can be complicated. And I think in those situations, that's when you bring in the, a judge in the court process to determine like what's right. Um, so it, 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 it is difficult. But what I'm trying to wrap my head around is this idea that a probation-led search is in lieu of a, a, a police or sheriff's search. So, I mean, how does it happen that they don't do the searches because the probation department did? Um, is, are we just trusting that happens? Is, is that part of agreements? Like, how, how do we know that, again, that our searches are not in addition to their searches as opposed to in lieu of their searches? <laughs> That happens early on in 109. That happens. Probation did a search. SEO did a search today, and the sheriff did one. Two hours later, that happens. We 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 heard some of those comments early on in realignment, right? And our communication with our sheriff partners, our law enforcement partners, have grown over the last couple of years, right? But what you said does happen, right? I'm not saying it doesn't. It does happen because I've I've heard about those instances where probation did a search last week. Hey, it's a sheriff's is this out here last week as we're, we're doing the compliance check, right? And that communication has gotten a lot better over the years, but it does happen more so before than now. Okay, so that makes it hard for me to think that these searches are in lieu of the other searches, um, as opposed to just more searches. Uh, okay. Um, but then the other thing is you suggested that, you know, there's a spike in burglaries, right? That makes logical sense to me. Narrative sense makes total sense. Um, I've done some work trying to figure out how do law enforcement agencies know when there is a spike and where it's at. And uh, I, I have not been impressed by law enforcement's ability to really uh, understand that sort of granular data about crime or to predict it, which some will say that they can do. Um, and, and it's not probation's job to do that. So how do you know that there is a spike of catalytic converter thefts in some neighborhood in San Gabriel, for example? We'll, we'll, we'll talk to the uh, law enforcement. There's media out there, right? Or, or we hear about it on, on the streets. Or it might be a DPO record saying, hey, uh, my, my client just came in. And he said, hey, did something go wrong? Something's going on in that, that neighborhood. So we get intel from all over the place, different sources. And so that's how these uh, op plans and the locations and could come up, which is just information. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wong, um, I know there was a draft report. Is there a window where we can expect that? Um, it looks like we should be able to get to uh, Late this week, maybe tomorrow or early next week. Okay, I'll talk to a uh, coordinate for the chief Fletcher and uh, chief Patino. That's that's great. I know last time I also sort of peppered in a, a comment that you you seem to uh, agree with. But is can we can we either follow up with a uh, a site visit to the AB 109s who are incarcerated at the Men Central Jail, so we can get a list of my. Nope, that doesn't sound familiar. No, uh, to Men Central Jail. 
Well, is this is there any any of your, of your those who are who've been violated still under the probation umbrella? Yes, and I assume there's a unit for these specific violators. Uh, we have to we'll have to check with the sheriffs on if there's right. specific sections that they have these 109 folks on. All right, we can look into that then. Okay. Is there um what about what about um what about these ride-alongs that you're describing? Um. I'm just, I'm just wondering now if it can be some commissioners who would be interested in um, maybe shadowing you guys and, you know, not obviously not getting in your ways, but just getting a, getting, you know, um, a good understanding of what's happening and why it's happening, how it's happening. Yeah, oh, that it shouldn't be a problem. It shouldn't be a problem. We coordinate that uh, the, the, the chiefs. Thank you. Well, I hope it's not two at, at two in the morning, but. No, <laughs> well, it's usually early morning. It's usually early morning. Yeah, and I think other commissioners might want to be involved in that as well. But I really appreciate your your presentation. It was it was um, it was very it was very informative, and I and, and I thank you for being candid with us and frank. And I look forward to having you back on. I really do. Thank you, Commission. Thank you so much. Uh, any other commissioners? I'm sorry. Before we move on, I'm not sure if I've already said that. Okay. This is Commissioner Nong. I have a couple of questions, actually. If that's okay. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> just the first question, because I just wanted to get it answered. Um, do these SEO officers, do they actually get training on how to work with young people? And if so, how much training do they get before uh, they're actually put into the training? They do, just people in general that would do, put them, they do, they, these guys get a lot of training. So the answer is yes, but to be more specific, let me follow up with our staff training office to get your specific on the young people piece. I know uh, they have taken tactical communications, which is communications across all, right? All ages and groups, I've taken that. But to be specific to the young people, let me find out and get back. Thank you. Um, a second question is when they're in the juvenile halls, are they armed? No. Okay. And if you were to bring in, <clears throat> I know that there's, you know, discussions about tasers, does that also mean that they would not be carrying those when they're inside the halls if they were to? No, no. Okay. Um, and then I guess I'm just wondering about how long have, has it been a practice for SEOs to be called in to the juvenile hall? I know Chief Deputy Fletcher mentioned it was during, you know, a spike in incidents, but I'm just wondering either how long this has been a practice and also is there a plan to um, continue calling these units in. So the deployments since COVID, so on and off since COVID, right? Uh, for deployments when folks you know, staffing issues, people got sick, but SEO is called in on AWOLs, right? So historically, any of our sites that have an AWOL, SEO is called in, and that goes back to way before my time, right? On AWOLs and, and major disturbances, right? Where they need um, additional staff. So we do get, you know, it's pretty, it doesn't happen often uh, where we will get a call. Hey, something's going on. Uh, can you guys come up and, you know, help? Mm -hmm. But for what you're talking about since COVID on and off for deployments. Okay. And so I'm hearing a walls and major disturbances, but I've also heard that sometimes they're there just for presence. Um, and you also mentioned canines, um, transport. And I wrote down the 3rd 1. Um, Canines transport and, you know, supplementing the units. How long has that been going on? Uh, the canines since roughly 2017 when we started getting our canines. Right about 2017 ish when we started getting our canines uh, teams in order. Uh, transports. I'm going to go back maybe 3 or 4 years when we have some, a couple of uh, high profile. High risk folks. That are in our uh, sites that have medical appointments. Um, sometimes it's a court order from the court saying, "Hey, probation armed SEO folks will need to transport th this person to a, a funeral or to a doctor's appointment." So it's by court order also, and that goes back to whenever we get the, the cut for as a court order. Okay, um, I'm going to end with another question. So, and I guess one other question is: Is there is there any data or can we get data available on how often these officers are being deployed? Um, 
like, and when they're there, for example, what are they there for? Um, how often they're actually involved in incidents, whether they're major disturbances or things like that. Is that data available and, and can we get it? Major disturbances, that's rare. I've been doing this since 14. I can count two for major disturbances, right? Mm -hmm. AWOLs, maybe four since I've been here since 2014. And the, the other one you're talking about, about just for the presence, it's since COVID, um, two years. And it's on and off what we'll do like two months at a time and then we're good and then we get called back. So it's pretty random. Yeah, I would love to see those numbers. And I actually have a question. I'm not, this is just a question whether it's Chief Heavy Fletcher or you or even just the commissioner. I just wanted to think through how to get a better handle on why they're being brought in, you know, and what is actually happening um, when they're being brought in. I just, what's the best way to learn more? Is it follow up conversations with certain people who are the ones calling them in, um, the superintendents? Like, who should we talk to? So I'd be happy to, to talk about it um, and our superintendents. Uh, it is really a combination of things, um, staffing levels, some of the incidents, uh, getting kids to school, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, I would, we could connect and then I could bring in our two superintendents. Okay. Thank you. And that's it for me, Chair. Check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I see Commissioner uh, Yamashiro's hand is up. Thank you. Just one, one, one more, a couple more questions. So, um, uh, so, Mr. Wong, uh, I had a question regarding the just to kind of paint a fuller picture of what a compliance check looks like. Uh, in particular, the you know how how the probation officers are present themselves. So, I'm assuming that the officers are are you know appear uh, in in tactical gear. Is that fair? To say? Uh, they're in uniform. Yeah, and they're wearing bulletproof vests. Yes, they are. And they're they have sidearm. Obviously, that's the whole point, really, of this part of this conversation, right? Correct. Um, so I'm, you know, okay. So 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 then I, I guess my 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 uh, question then is for, um, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the of uh, Miss Fletcher. So I, you know, it. I, my question, I guess, is is the appearance of of these probation officers at the front door of your apartment or your home, and I also want to say I I don't think that the the that the the, the search of a prison cell or a jail cell uh, is a good comparison point for a search of a home, um, but with that said, I'm just curious, Ms. Fletcher, you have officers who arrive at a location in full tactical gear. Um, I don't know what their demeanor is. I don't know if they're, you know, if they have special training and they actually employ that training. I don't know, but it seems to me that there's very little to, to distinguish, at least visually, between a probation officer standing there with a sidearm and tactical gear, and LAPD, Pacific Division, um, and, and may, maybe even Pacific Division might look less threatening. So uh, aside from that, I'm just curious why why do you think it's a better situation? Or a better policy that the department employ these tactic these officers, uh, probation officers to do these compliance checks as opposed to law enforcement. I know part of the answer because and I I've had plenty of clients who have complained about how they were treated during these compliance checks when it was LAPD and the sheriff's department, plenty. Um, but I want to just ask you directly since you have kind of asserted that there is a qualitative difference between how the probation department approaches this. And how law enforcement might, I'm just curious, or at least that you say that it's better that that we do it than local law enforcement. I was curious as to why. Sure, absolutely. So I think that our our skills and our training are much different than a local beat cop, right? Um, our SEO officers are some of the most highly trained officers in the department. Um, they do go with the idea of making sure that everyone is safe. But the mindset going in from probation's perspective versus law enforcement is we know that probation, we have to go back into that home. We have to go back and, and work with that individual. We have to go back in and often work with that family. So the focus on 
making sure that there is a respectful interaction, that there is follow-up. SEO can certainly connect people to services, can have a conversation when they come back with the assigned probation officer to talk about the needs or anything found in a search. That's all very different than a law enforcement officer who's just rolling up to the house based on a suspicion of something, right? Or just going in because by law, they have the ability to conduct a probation search without probation's permission or presence. So it is a, a, a different environment, a different atmosphere when our probation staff go in, as opposed to uh, a police officer who is working in the area. Okay, you say that, but like what, I mean, are you, are you, are, is this unit wearing body worn cameras? Probation does not wear cameras. Why not? We have not actually even explored that. I know other departments in California are looking at that, especially in custodial settings, uh, but we have not yet done that. So I guess what I'm, I guess, I mean, you may not know this, but I mean, how do you know it's a different, I mean, I understand that your officers are trained differently. I don't think the incentive structure that you're referencing somehow that the the SIE this this unit has an incentive structure to make sure that it's a kind of polite uh, congenial interaction between the client and the family. Um, I don't think that necessarily that is different than a police officer who's working their beat and and has to make, and has a reason to believe or is just doing a compliance check. I don't. I mean, I'm just asking. You know, it, it doesn't seem to follow to me. And so when you say that they're different, quote unquote. A different environment. I mean, have you been on one of these searches and, and have you been been with an LA, LASD search? And can you say like how, how it is that they're different? So, I have not in LA County, but I was an armed officer in uh, another county and I did conduct those compliance checks and it is different. And I think just from my experience, I can share with you, even when we would partner with law enforcement. We would have conversations with the law enforcement agency saying, we are the lead, you are here for support, please let us manage this visit. And so it is a, di a different mindset. Uh, our officers are required to have bachelor's degrees. They do, do go through extensive training about how to work with clients and provide that community supervision. And that's not necessarily the, the complete training that a law enforcement officer uh, assigned to the sheriff's department or a city police agency necessarily has the benefit of. Okay, but that was that was in a not this, that was not in LA County. You're saying right? This is not your own personal experience in some other county, right? Right. I said that I had not experienced in LA County, but we're all trained the same way throughout the state. So I'm curious. You mentioned a model earlier where the probation officer rolls up and they have law enforcement there as backup. Why is it better to do it with a unit that's completely divorced from the supervision of the of the probationer? Why not have the the sworn officer appear with law enforcement backup uh, to conduct the compliance check? Why is it optimal to do it this way? So, in a lot of situations, our assigned probation officer doesn't have the tactical training that our SEO staff have, and so. In many situations, our SEO officers don't need the support of local law enforcement to go into a house. If you have a, a, a case carrying probation officer who is unarmed, may not have all of that training, likely they're going to need some support, especially if there is some um, history of violence or weapons in the home or with the uh, actual probation officer or a probationer, excuse me. Thank you. Mr. Wong, before I pass on to commissioner, um, you know, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. There's also, um, another commissioner, commissioner Meredith will be up as well. You know, I, I'm wondering about abuse here. So I know that your, your unit has the ability to go into a home without there needing to be a search warrant. Versus, I think Ms. Fletcher said that partnerships need, obviously LAPD sheriff's department needs a warrant for. So no to so let me say my question. So my my question is, uh, I'm just wondering these partnerships. Is there ever? I'm not sure if this is even maybe a question for you, but I'm wondering if it happens in general, where probation is being abused by law enforcement to get into a home, knowing that they don't need 
search warrant because the people are on probation and they can just access it via probation. Is there anything? No, the, the condition is actually search and seizure with or without warrant by law enforcement, which includes the police. 24 hours a day, so they don't need us to get into a house. Okay. Got it. Got it. Commissioner Meredith and then Commissioner Long. Okay, my feathers are getting a little ruffled here because I'm tired of the police getting attacked. And I'm tired of probation getting attacked for doing the job they do. Two different functions here. Law enforcement can do the search and seizure without probation, and they have a whole different purpose when they do it. And they're not a bunch of armed people attacking people when they go there. They're doing it for a lawful purpose. The other side, I've seen SEO in action, and there's actually some videos out there on YouTube if you watch them in action. They have a whole different mindset. They're going there, A, tactically, because the people that they're usually going to be addressing are much more significant and dangerous individuals than a person who's on probation for a DUI or a petty theft. So I, I think we're mixing a lot of things here, a lot of passion, a lot of feelings coming up that we think that you know they're acting as some kind of armed force going and abusing the probationer when that's not what's happening. They're due for a compliance check. If you're on probation, you know the rules and regulations subject to search and seizure, especially if you're an AB 109 or post community super release, that you've got a search and seizure package. It also says that every California post standard training that is not to be for um, retribution or uh, harassment or any other purpose. They're all taught that. So I just got to get that out because I'm getting my feathers ruffled because law enforcement are professional. Probation is professional. I have seen them in action. I encourage you to go watch those videos. Thank you. Commissioner Meredith, you know, the same way that that your your opinion is valid, so is everyone else's. And I know your feathers are ruffled, as you're saying. And look, man, I, I, I said it earlier, I don't want to get personal, but some law enforcement officers are definitely not living by the letter of the law. So we're not saying that anyone specifically on probation, we're just having a conversation to get down to some some um you know some business here. So I, I I'm glad you're taking it personal. But I think so all, I, all the commissioners have the right to to uh, ask. I'm, any I'm not questions. saying I'm not saying they don't. What I'm saying is is that we're dealing with things. We're dealing. We got to be factual when we deal with these things. Yes. Do some officers go rogue? Absolutely. And we have a process for dealing with them. But we're talking about SEOU here. They do a job out there where they're going out for compliance checks. And I have not seen any significant um, bad press or complaints coming against how they do it because they have a whole different role. You know, trying to protect the community, and they do work to try and rehabilitate that probationer. I want to I want to hold you for a minute, uh, Commissioner Long, and ask uh, Commissioner Canales to jump in before I call on you. So sorry about that, Commissioner Canales. Hi. Yes. Thank you. I've been listening to everything, and um, it, it's hard to just uh, you know take things at value because hearsay is often in, inadmissible, right? So I'm hearing that they don't have cameras. And I understand, Commissioner Meredith, that they are an, a team of excellence, but there's always human error, you know, so they, they don't have body cameras. Director Fletcher, you have not yet went on one in LA County and LA County versus the size of Alameda County is a huge difference. But one thing that did catch my attention, you said they often just go just to provide resources. Are you collecting any data on these visits of how many resources have been provided and are the clients accepting the resources? No, they're not going to simply to provide resources. They have the ability to provide them. So that's not their ultimate goal. That is the assigned officer's goal. Mm -hmm. um, they're going for the compliance check, but oftentimes our officers can uh, make those referrals. And I don't believe we have any data on how many of those specific instances uh, where a client has followed up. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I'm also wondering, uh, like, let's just say that there's a day that there, for instance, in my experience, in my personal experience, uh, you, you know, one time a team came out to the home and I called uh, to follow up and see, you know, what was going on and everything. And uh, I was told, you know, actually they were pretty good that day at your house. I, I got a, a whole slew of complaints from other homes uh, that, you know, had been visited earlier. And so I'm wondering, like, who takes those calls? Let's say somebody does just call in or do they have to go online and fill out, you know, one of the, the citizens complaints online? Or is there a number that they could call? Or do does the CEO even leave a card and say, you know, you can call my supervisor if there was anything wrong with this visit or you, if you felt this visit, you know, is there anything like that, like for further communication? So the, the supervisor of that unit 
during the, that debrief with the client, we'll, we'll leave a, a business card and uh, we will get uh, complaints usually through the ombudsman if there is one, mm -hmm. right? So, and it's tracked and it's reviewed by, uh, the, by the managers and responded back to. So, and written ones too, so. Okay, thank you. I was just wondering uh, those things. Thank you very much, Commissioner Cadio. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Nong. Thank you. I actually just had a follow up for Chief Deputy Fletcher, and this is uh, more <clears throat> of a request just because I really appreciate you taking it, you know, being willing to meet separately with me or others, including with superintendents, and I know you're really busy. So, in the interest of trying to make the meeting productive, I'm wondering if there could be materials given to us in advance to review. Um, I had mentioned this before, so even just um, the materials that Mr. Wong mentioned about any additional training specifically related to youth um, that the SEO officers get. And also um, just wondering, you know, I was trying to think through how to get more information on how often, you know, SEO is this is wrong said like deployed. So are there sort of like general documentation, whether there's schedules or something um, that exists that could just be shared with us to show, to reflect how often they were deployed, both either intentionally in advance for presence, like during spikes or during COVID um, or spontaneously, and just wondering if we could get those in advance as well. We could yes, think for right. time period for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we can provide the training um, that our SEO officers receive. Um, and also we have, um, because we did schedules with logs, I think we would have to, to for deployment in general um, across the department, I wanna make sure that we're capturing who actually was available to go and who wasn't. Um, so we'll go back and look to see exactly what we have that might be helpful, but we will get you the training uh, list um, pretty easily. Great, I appreciate that. I think the schedules and even just the time period because I've heard during COVID it was different and then you're mentioning these spikes. So just making sure that um, we get sort of a before and after so we have the context um, for the changes in deployments, if there are any as well, would be really helpful. Okay, we will see what we actually can uh, produce. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. We are moving on to item number five now, Mr. Wong. Again, thanks so much. Thank you, Commissioner. We are here. Uh, we will hear a report from representatives from the Los Angeles Pro County Probation Department on progress the department has made with the moving youth back to Central Juvenile Hall. Chief Deputy Karen Fletcher, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Carrillo. Um, so, as everyone recalls, uh, in mid March, uh, March 10th to be exact, we submitted our corrective action plan to the uh, State Board of Community Corrections. On March 11th, that Friday, they responded and indicated that we must move the youth from the facility at Central Juvenile Hall. Otherwise, they would uh, be at the facility the week of March 14th. So as a result, uh, we made very quick decisions to move our youth over that weekend, March 12th and 13th, um, notifying everyone who was impacted, unions, judges, uh, attorneys, uh, providers, uh, and the POC. So I'm happy to report that um, you know, our original intent was a 90-day suspension of operations. Um, we have done a tremendous amount of work. We reported at the last meeting about the significant work that was done at Central Juvenile Hall to make it um, a better place for our youth. So as a result, we have been able to move our youth back to Central Juvenile Hall um, prior to our 90 days. And so we moved uh, our youth in four phases beginning last Wednesday, May 18th, when we moved 26 youth uh, on Friday, May 20th, we moved an additional 12 youth. On Monday, the 23rd of May, we moved 25 youth. And just yesterday, we moved 24 youth. So that was a total of 107, I'm sorry, 187 youth that have moved back to Central uh, over this last week. Originally, we moved 135 of our youth from Central Juvenile Hall to Barry J. Many of them have been released or have camp commitments. So these 87 youth did go back. 
Um, during this pause time, uh, as everyone knows, we remained open for intake. Um, and during that intake process, so from March 14th through May 18th, there were 226 intakes at Central Juvenile Hall that were then moved to Barry J. Um, what we are working on is looking at a group of a little over 25 youth currently that we will assess to determine whether or not they will stay at Barry J or move back to Central. And that's largely based on the court that they are assigned to. So if they're at the Long Beach court or at East Lake, we don't want them to stay up in uh, Silmar, for example. So we will move those kids. So we're assessing them now. They will be moved in much smaller groups, maybe in groups of two or three as we uh, do that assessment. We're also considering out of that group, you know, how many of those youth might be released outright um, so that we're not moving them just to have them go somewhere else or be released. And so at, at our next meeting, I can report back on that smaller group. Um, all of the movements were done without incident. Um, we um, have made all the notica notifications uh, while the youth were being transported or after they arrived at Central, all of the parents or guardians were contacted. Um, all of the defense counsel leadership uh, was notified, our district attorney's office, of course, the judges, all of our unions uh, and um, the POC. So all of that was very smooth and largely um, due to the partnership with Department of Mental Health, Juvenile Court Health Services, and LACO. Um, so as kids uh, got back to their units in each movement, uh, our staff met them there, made sure they had everything that they needed, uh, brought in pizza for the youth um, as a, a thank you for their cooperation in the movement process. Um, and as they have gotten back, um, Mental health staff have been on site. LACO staff has been able to make sure that uh, education is not being interrupted. Um, and we are working on making sure that our youth have outdoor recreation uh, as well as visiting. So even, even the youth that were moved uh, last Wednesday and Friday received visits uh, on Saturday and Sunday. Religious services have resumed for those youth as well. So. Um, we're grateful for the partnership and certainly um, the support shown by the POC in this process. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Karen. Uh, in the meantime, Wendy, do we have any written or live comments? For this item? Uh, we certainly do. Thank you. Um, we're going to start with JP. And Jennifer's going to bring the clock up and then we'll unmute you JP and you can begin. Oh, I apologize commissioners. This is JP. I'm a forensics advocate. I was actually wanting to make a comment. I was a little behind on the previous agenda, but I, I just took to throw out there. Uh, I was just curious as a, and I put it in the chat, but, but as a, a forensic Forensics advocate. I mean, is there any? I'm just curious if there's any um, strategy that is or strategic uh, planning that's going on in um, doing these compliance checks. Whatever arm of agency is moving in to do this, if it's if it's for a reason of having any effect on the current charges that are placed on the client, or uh, whichever arm is in there can further charges another violation of a probation is is in order or violation of probation and other charges i, I guess what i'm trying to ask is if there's a strategy that uh known strategy that this is whatever arms picked the effects that it has on the case itself and if that is what's uh, in consideration when doing these checks i think i I'm trying. I'm I think I think I've tried to ask it I, without asking it or comment. That was just my feedback. I uh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. I thought you had finished. Uh, we'll go next to Mary Borfio. Mary, thanks for holding on, and you have your full two minutes now. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, 
as I was mentioning earlier that I just couldn't believe the lies that Karen Fletcher and the chief were telling the probation overnight commission. Um, they, were, they had said that they involved the supervisors and managers when they decided to move the youth from the central, from central to Barry J to an all hall. And that was a lie. The supervisors and directors found out about the move in an email the night before. And then Karen and Stolfo showed up the next morning for five minutes to be able to tell us that they talked to the staff and that was lies as well. The POC made a board, made it a board motion for the chief to provide a copy of the plan used for the move. Um, just curious, did he provide one? Did they provide proof that they notified parents? Did they need to hold them accountable? Well, we, you guys need to hold them accountable for this. Karen um, said the new superintendent came with a wealth of knowledge and experience. Well, he has no juvenile experience and is always on vacation and complaining about being in the halls. He makes statements like, I don't know anything. I don't know why I was sent here. He says he doesn't want to work holidays. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be, excuse me. He doesn't want to work holidays and he wants to be home in time for dinner with his family. Um, what about the families? Our staff are held over while the new managers leave daily at 5 p.m. regardless of what's happening. Our efforts are clearly not appreciated. They showed this by not promoting the most qualified candidates for our in institutions. Instead, of, instead, they promote inexperienced field staff that we now have to train at all the time that we need experience the most. What a terrible decision and what a terrible and what terrible timing. Your time has expired. Um, I, I noticed that Krista Newble was there and now isn't. Um, can you unmute Krista, Janae, just to make sure she didn't? I actually, she was actually signed up to speak on a previous item that I didn't call her on. Krista, you're unmuted. Did you want to speak on this item? No, I wanted to speak on the um, AB 109 SEO. I don't know if I can do it right here. Frankie, is that is that okay for her to do that? That was, she had actually signed up for that item, and I didn't call her on it. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to provide some clarity because I know you guys are speaking about how the caseload carrying deputy felt, and I worked for AB one hundred nine from twenty fourteen to twenty nineteen. I personally think it's one of the best programs that we have within our department. And I wanted to tell you about the compliance check because there's a difference between the compliance check and the home check and what Mr. Wong is thinking of. In those five years, I have only had two complaints. And those two complaints were from our partnering agencies outside law enforcement agencies, not from us. I have been, I personally, um, Frankie, I know you had asked a question about if someone, it may not have been you, had been present when law enforcement have done it and when our people have done it. And I actually have been present and I actually have carried a case for co-occurring co um, mental health AB 109ers. And there is a big difference. And the difference is, is that we take the time to explain things. We talk to them. I've had SEO call me if there was someone being difficult where a sheriff wouldn't call me, they just hook them and book them. They've called me if they've had difficulty, they couldn't speak to someone. If someone was in a crisis when they showed up to their house, and that was my caseload. They've called, they've put in notes. They've said, hey, this person may need a referral. You may need to come over. Or can you talk to them because we're having a problem? SEO has gone above and beyond um, to avoid violating or doing anything. If they, if we do our job correctly, we have prepared our clients to know that this could happen. We provide them with all the coulds that could happen, as well as they're very respectful. Um, and again, I work with the most challenging and I have never had a problem. SEO has contacted me. They've asked me about houses. Um, if we do what we're supposed to do, we're supposed to describe the house, describe the rooms, where they're at and put it in our, our apps. And we do that and they'll come to us. Thank you. Thanks very much. That's the end of public comment. Chair Carrillo. Thank you, Wendy. Commissioners, I have see a couple of hands that are up. And I wanted to maybe I'll just start off and and um, you know I, I I'm really happy that staff are calling in, and uh, more specifically Miss Portillo calling in and 
Uh, Ms. Fletcher, I, you know, to the point is, are you lying to us? <laughs> Absolutely not, uh, Chair Carrillo. So as we have indicated in every report out, we submitted the correction, uh, corrective action plan on March 10th, which was a Thursday. On March 11th at about 445, the BSCC sent us a letter that said that if youth are in uh, the facility at Central Juvenile Hall on March 14th, that they would potentially come and um, um, inspect. We made notifications that evening uh, of when uh, what we intended to do in terms of pausing the operation that we had outlined in the plan and vetted in our March 10th letter to the BSCC. We had called each board office to make sure that they were aware. We had conversations with county council as well about the about our plan to request the the 90 day pause. So we were as surprised as everyone else to receive the letter on the 11th, indicating that we had to move. So those notifications were happening, uh, quite honestly, as I was on a freeway trying to get uh, to LA County from out of town. I was making phone calls, emails were being sent. As part of the request from the POC, I provided every piece of communication that occurred uh, that I was aware of that uh, related to the move. We did go into the institutions. The chief was there with me all day on Saturday, as was Mr. Bettino, uh, and I returned on Sunday and stayed all day until every kid was transported out of Central Juvenile Hall to Barry J. So it is, it, it, no one's lying to this commission. We have reported absolutely everything that we have done with regard to the move out of Central and now with the move back to Central. Um, and we've provided the documents that we have in which we can show that we did notify folks. Were our staff surprised by the move? Absolutely. We were surprised as well on Friday night, um, but we made every attempt. Uh, the chief and Adam and I walked around in the units at Central on Saturday morning, checking in with staff because certainly, you know, uh, rumors uh, start and we wanted to make sure they were hearing it from us on Saturday morning. The directors were on site. Several supervisors were on site that actually assisted with this move. Um, and we all worked together in that room to make sure that we were doing it in the safest and most methodical way that we could on very short notice. And, and that is how the move out of Central uh, occurred. Commissioner Vice Chair Jackson, you're up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thank you, um, Ms. Fletcher, for your, um, for your update. I'll be honest, I'm a little underwhelmed um, by it. You've submitted some summaries to the POC on the phase return um, of the youth back to CJH. And um, I think I was just really hoping for more detailed information on that process outside of it being safe and uneventful. Um, we've talked about for weeks, um, and, I, and I think we could all agree about how important thoughtful and strategic planning um, is uh, to mitigate some of the effects of the move on top of all of these other issues um, that have been sort of looming over the department. Um, is there a reason, Ms. Fletcher, why the POC hasn't received more detailed information on the planning behind the return? Um, for example, results of some of these assessments that you say are guiding the decisions to return the youth back to Central, um, Maybe the capacity assessments that are in alignment with the construction, um, which units are open, which are uh, under construction, which youth have been assigned to those units. Um, have the youth, have the staff be, um, have they received any sort of uh, orientation, reorientation upon returning back to the unit? Like we don't have those, we don't have that information. Do you have any update that's just more substantive to like some of the things that have taken place behind the scenes? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, and we had uh, some preliminary discussion um, with Ms. Julian and Dr. Reynoso about the plan around how we collaborated with our partners. So mental health, juvenile court health services, and LACO. Much of that was shared in the last meeting. Um, we have uh, a plan that we had laid out with our partners to make sure that uh, DMH, for example, was going into the units. Say, for example, like we only moved on Friday, May 20th, we only moved our DD kids, our developmentally disabled youth, 
because they often have the most needs. And so 12 of those youth that were in that unit were moved. No other units were moved. We did that based on an assessment that was conducted uh, by mental health going into the units to make sure that our youth were prepared for the move. Our staff on site uh, working in the units had conversations with those youth. They helped them uh, pack up their personal belongings for transport. So all of those conversations were happening with our staff and our youth. Mental health, LACO was involved, um, and certainly juvenile court health services. We did not publicize exactly the time or the, um, the dates or the units of the move for safety reasons. And so we had a complete outline of what we believed was going to happen on every single day. Um, those numbers changed a little bit because some youth were ordered to camp, for example, or they were released from custody. So the initial count of youth, I think, was at 96. We actually moved 87 of those youth. And so that was all documented that we have on uh, paper and what units they were going to. That was not publicized um, because of the safety uh, concerns that we uh, have continually stated. So a lot of planning, a lot of coordination happened behind the scenes uh, about the move back. We wanted to also make sure that the timing of the move in the afternoons were happening so that we weren't disrupting school attendance and we were able to accomplish that. So when youths were brought back from school in that school movement back to their units, then we were engaging with those youth. We were making sure they had food, they had everything that they needed prior to the transport. Um, and again, uh, after school so that it would not be disruptive. And then when we got our youth to Central and got them settled, um, brought in food for them and then made sure that they had outdoor recreation and again, uh, had already communicated um, with all of our visiting folks and had staff standing by to help facilitate visiting on that Saturday and Sunday. So a, a lot was happening behind the scenes uh, and a lot of communication was happening with our partners internally. I, I appreciate that. Um, I do think, um, well, I don't know if I agree with the fact that you said earlier that you've reported on everything that you've done the POC certainly hasn't seen anything in writing. I do understand like the privacy concerns and the need to sort of protect that. But of course, we, we protect confidentiality of process and I just, I just have not seen anything and have been really disappointed um, by that. And with all due respect, this is so much greater than, you know, a pizza party. This is us having trust in your process and the things that happen that lead to really, really important decisions. Um, and I don't know if I feel confident that that has happened. Yeah, and for us, absolutely, it wasn't about a pizza party. This was about rewarding kids for a great process. Um, they cooperated, they understood, they asked really good questions. We got them services as they requested those services and made sure that their parents were notified. So I don't want anyone walking away thinking that just because we gave kids pizza, um, makes it okay. This is a challenging and difficult situation that we had to do. Um, they are being brought back into a facility that looks a lot better than the facility that we left. So we're very happy about that. And we're working very diligently on making sure that programming is in place as well. Okay, well, are you at this point able to submit anything in writing um, to the POC around all that has happened sort of um, in your planning, including um, the information about where youth are housed, how many, things like that? Yes, absolutely. We have a grid and it shows the buildings that are offline and the buildings that are occupied by uh, what classification of youth and a breakdown of the phase in which they were moved. I, I'd be happy to provide that. Okay, and what about the results of um, these assessments that you say you're conducting? Right, so the assessments that were conducted by um, Department of Mental Health, though that was going in. I don't think they have anything formally written, um, but those assessments were talking to kids, making sure that um, they felt the tone of the unit was at a place where we could safely um, move the youth. I can certainly follow up with DMH to see if they have anything in writing, uh, but they did go into those units. 
The assessments that I'm speaking of about the other youth that are remaining at Barry J, we are looking at what court they're assigned to is the primary uh, deciding factor when they could potentially be released from custody. And these are those youth that are with us that came in, uh, were not originally from Central, but would have been, right? They were taken into the intake process during the 66 days that uh, we were non-operational. Okay, um, and, and lastly, is there any communication between not you and, uh, you know, partners, but you and probation leadership that might be helpful to the POC and understanding what kind of conversations have taken place behind deciding on the move and, you know, how many kids would be decided to um, move on this day for this reason at this time? So that probably is just reflected in our grid. Uh, we have it broken down by phases and the number of youth. Um, I can certainly, I don't think there's anything written about the rationale, um, but what the um, staff were doing and the leadership at Barry J was really assessing every day what the tenor of the units were. Um, we had many conversations with Mr. Lewis uh, about ARC and um, what may be needed uh, if anything were to occur. And we also are uh, working with Abigail Richards from Young Women's Freedom Center. They were not available the day that we moved uh, our young women from the facility, but they are interested in coming in and um, meeting our young people and talking about ways that we can partner in serving uh, the females. So um, I'm not sure that I can hand over uh, notes or anything uh, that we took. A lot of it was walking through units and talking to kids. Our superintendent um, and all of our directors were walking through. I walked through with them on uh, Wednesday and talked to kids as we were getting ready to move. So a lot of that assessment uh, was happening really in real time. Okay, well, the POC would appreciate submission of that grid. Thank you, and I'll leave it to other commissioners. I might have a follow-up question, but I'm good for now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Dupuy, you're up. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Carrillo. I um, I really uh, appreciate uh, Ms. Uh, Portillo, I think, calling in also, as I think this commission and the public knows, I've been concerned about staff morale um, and their sentiments around all of this. And I did know that there was a, a survey that was done of staff and wondering, um, um, Chief Deputy Fletcher, if those results of the surveys for the staff have come in and whether we can get um, a copy of those results or a summary. Absolutely. Um, I'll follow up. Albert Banuelos has taken the lead on that. Um, when I last talked to him, it was still open, so I'll verify that. I have not seen the completed survey yet, uh, but we would be happy to share that. Okay, thank you very much. That was it, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Canales, you're up. Hi, thank you so much. Um, yes, actually, uh, several of my questions were answered in this last one because the last meeting, um, Ms. Fletcher, you did mention ARC and Young Women's Freedom Center and working and coordinating with them in the strategic plan and the moves and everything. So I was wondering their role in uh, these last moves. Um, were they, so I guess Young Women's Freedom Center was not available, but they hope to be available for the next ones. And was uh, ARC able to be on site during these moves? So they were not available to be on site, um, but I was in in communication with Mr. Lewis, um, and you know he was certainly understanding uh, what was happening there. We did have healing dialogues in action who were on site for a couple of days. They weren't there specifically for the movement, uh, but I ran into that group um, and informed them of what was happening and they were on site should they be needed um, and they weren't needed in in these uh, moves at that point. Okay, thank you. And then one other question, um, you said that the staff was notified, you had a lot of communication with staff because uh, since we weren't you know, given the strategic plan prior, do you have copies of memos and how many days prior did you alert your staff and did you do actual walks on? on the facilities talking face-to-face -face with staff and 
uh, the way that you mentioned, you know, all the other um, partners involved and like, did you talk each shift on site to every shift on staff or uh, was it just one shift or how did that go? Summer. Right, so um, written communication did not go out about the specific dates because we were assessing whether or not the units were safe to move. The directors and the superintendents at both facilities were walking around and informing staff so that they were aware. So as the kids were um, in classrooms, in in-person school, our staff were getting ready for that move. So our transportation deputies were well aware and they came in to help drive uh, and make sure that our kids were safe and the staff in the units. So we had to, to really orchestrate so that we had staff that were riding in the vans with our youth back to Central who worked at Central, making sure their personal vehicles were at Central so that when they ended their shift with a youth, um, uh, they could uh, readily be able to leave the facility and go home. Um, so all of that coordination was happening on site uh, with the directors and the staff themselves. So all of our staff that were impacted by the units with the central uh, youth um, were all notified. Um, and it is interesting and very telling, right? So any Barry J staff that you know, was going to stay at Barry J uh, actually came in to say goodbye to the kids. Um, so when there was any kind of overlap with school transports or anything like that, uh, there were relationships being built. So it was nice to see on site uh, as the movements were starting that those kids and those youth uh, in a very short period of time had built those relationships and were saying goodbye at that point. Same with the LACO teachers as well. Okay, thank you. And then uh, we're all uh, employees notified. I know during our meet, our face to face meeting at Barry J, you did guarantee us that there would be a lot of communication with staff prior and everything from the warehouse worker to the floor staff to medical. We're all everybody was notified this time around. Yes, our staff were notified. Uh, they were notified when it was completed as well. Um, there's a lot of movement at the facility, right? And so everyone was aware and being notified by directors. Um, I was notifying the unions um, and all of our leadership was notifying their folks as well. Okay, thank you so much. And then uh, just one more thing that I'd like to say, I'd really like to thank Ms. Newble for calling in, uh, I, I might've said that your last name wrong, about the SEO. Uh, your presentation, your two minute presentation gave me a, a lot more clarity, I think about the role and even your personal experience. So I thank you for that comment and understanding it because I was getting a little bit uh, apprehensive with some of the descriptions of perfection. You know, that always makes me leery. All right, thank you so much. And that's it. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Garcia Lays, you're up. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to hear that perhaps this debacle is being put behind the department, but I want to make sure that the public is not misled by Chief Fletcher's statements that would seem to suggest that the state ordered the youth in Eat Lake to be moved to Barry J. Nidor. That's not what happened. The state said they were going to inspect the facility to ensure that the corrective action plan had been implemented. When the department found out that they were likely to fail that inspection, the department chose on its own to avoid accountability with the state by emptying Central and moving those kids to Silmar to avoid an inspection that they thought they were going to fail and thereby avoid accountability for their failure to implement the corrective action plan. As a result of that decision that was made by the department, um, we saw some of the worst conditions in juvenile confinement in a long time, youth on youth violence, youth on staff violence, staff falling off of roofs, um, you know, a, an unacceptable situation. Um, and I just want to make sure that the public has no misconception that that was the result of a state order and not the probation department's choice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner, um, oh, sorry, Ms. Fletcher, you want to respond to that? I never said that it was an order of the state. The state submitted their letter on that Friday afternoon at 445 that said if kids were in the facility beginning March 14th, they could come in and inspect. 
we moved those kids over that weekend. I never, uh, and if that was a misunderstanding, uh, uh, I want to make sure that everyone knows that that is not the intent to say that the state ordered us to move you. Thank you. Commissioner Meredith, you're up. Uh, Commissioner Garcia Lays actually brought up a point I was going to bring up, and I think we have a lot of either miscommunication or filtering or something that's taken place. The uh, couple of employees that called in with their concerns, they felt that they were misled. I just want to make sure that the department is at least outreaching to the employees so we don't have a bigger morale problem. I was out at Silmar yesterday by chance and uh, talking to some of the staff out there and some of the youth, and um, I still have some concerns. But more importantly, we have adequate staff at both facilities now. Uh, we are still having deployed staff because many of our staff are calling out. Uh, many of them are on leaves, and so we are working with the county's DHR uh, to see how we can address some of those um, outstanding concerns uh, and are continually talking to our CEO's office uh, about being able to hire. We're still under a hiring freeze. Um, but they certainly are uh, aware and have been working with us to identify what we need um, and we are moving forward with that. Um, but still we do have, unfortunately, staff who are calling out. And we're gonna ensure that we address the concerns that were brought up by those employees that called in that they uh, understand have better communications in the future. And I, th I think we, uh, are definitely, I mean, uh, communication is always a challenge, uh, especially in a large organization, um, but we are trying to make sure that our staff understand the expectations, they understand what we're doing um, to make sure that our facilities are meeting regulations that were within the, the uh, DOJ settlement and that we have the appropriate staffing levels. And so, that communication is happening, and again, uh, a lot of that is on site, face to face, with our directors, our superintendents, with the staff themselves, engaging, and also doing some mentoring around meeting those expectations when it comes to Title 15 and the DOJ settlement. Okay, uh, Chief Deputy Fletcher, thank you so much. Uh, we'll be moving on. I'm sorry, um, Commissioner Gonzalez. Are you gesturing? You had a question. Yes, I apologize. I was going to ask, um, and you probably already said it. There's been so much information, but the were the central staff able to go back to central, the ones that uh, wanted to? Yes. So absolutely, um, the staff were moved with the youth, um, and um, those staff have returned. So um, they're back home. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much uh, for those of you who are waiting for item number 6, we will be tabling that item for now. And we'll be moving right into item number 7. Uh, where we'll, we will be discussing and taking a uh, possible action on our executive director. Wendy Julian's report on the POC's pr progress towards completing its 2022 strategic goals outlined in the POC's 2022 strategic operating plan. Wendy, please share your updates. Thank you, Chair Carrillo, and it is uh, very late, so I'm just going to share three quick sentences. One is that we have submitted the 56 hour work week report to the probation department um, and that actually just happened and are giving them time to review it and give us input. But we will very much be looking forward to sharing that with you once we have a chance to talk it over with the department. Uh, second, with respect to. Um, girls decarceration, we're continuing to do an extensive amount of work with girls decarceration with the youth justice work group and the public defender's office with the board motion. Um, we, I would just like to reiterate that the, um, the work group is in need of demographic data, including uh, race and ethnicity data, uh, SOGI status, LGBTQIA status of um, identification of the girls and gender expansive youth in custody. That's an outstanding request. Um, speaking of outstanding data requests, I have good news to report on the data front, which is that uh, the Probation Oversight Commission and the department are very close to reaching an agreement to our memorandum of, of understanding for data sharing. And I'm very much looking to forward to reporting at the next meeting uh, that we have that signed. And then my last sentence, I just want to say that attached to the agenda today 
are the wonderful pre inspection reports that were conducted by commissioners uh, led by Dr. Reynoso, uh, as well as the department's thorough response to those inspections. So uh, please take a look at that and uh, I'll be presenting on that at public safety cluster next week on uh, on Wednesday, if you'd like to um, hear more about that presentation. Thank you, Wendy. Is there any written or, or live public comments for this item? There are not. The only hand I see up is JP, which is a hand from a former Ida. Um, I'm actually also thinking, Frankie, that uh, we probably need to go back to number six and uh, just make sure that we vote to table the item until next meeting. If we could do that with a voice vote really quick. Okay. That's the item on uh, the LA model in which we generally get a an update on the movement of secure track youth and the expansion of the LA model across the county. So you got an I vote for me. I'm not hearing anyone say anything but yes. So I think we can say that that's <laughs> that approved. Thank you. And no, uh, no public comment on this item or the other item. Okay. Commissioners, any comments, questions for this item, which is item number seven, Wendy's report. Okay. Not seeing any hands. I'm going to take that as a no and move on to uh, item number eight, which is um, one second here. Okay, so item number eight, are, are there any matters not posted on the agenda to discuss or to place on a future meeting agenda for action? And this is to the staff and the commissioners. Uh, Frankie, if I could just say, you'll be getting an email very shortly about an incredible panel that Dr. Reynoso has put on with the programs and services subcommittee. It's gonna be June 6th um, in the evening. Uh, it'll be on Zoom and uh, we really look forward to you coming to hear the uh, the experts, including folks with lived experience and people who've worked in the facilities, talk about uh, what programs and services have been affected for them. So you'll be hearing more about it shortly. Amazing. Commissioner, okay, no hands. Okay, moving on to uh, item number nine. Agenda item number nine is an invitation for members of the public to address the commission on items not on the agenda. Wendy, would you please facilitate this for us? I'm happy to, uh, we have no hands raised. Um, oh, I've got one hand raised and we'll call on him in a second. If you're calling in, dial star three to raise your hand on your phone. Um, and also thank you, Janae, for putting the link to the um, town hall on June 6th um, in the chat. So Jennifer, if you can pull up the timer, we will unmute James Maddox. James, welcome back. And uh, you have two minutes, you can begin. Thank you, just a couple of observations. Two adjectives come to mind to describe the meeting today, testy and ineffective. And then the next comment I have is that it seems as though the tail is wagging the dog. The labor, the union seems to be running the department. Um, but those are just two observations from a social worker. Thank you. Thank you, James. Next up, we have Thomas Bell. Thomas, we're going to unmute you. Not yet. Okay, you're ready to go. Oh, are you on? All right, you may be muting yourself, Thomas. We're going to try to. Un okay, there we go. You're good. I thank you. Yeah. Thomas, we yeah. you are really breaking up. We can't hear you. You know. Okay. This can you hear me now? That's much better. Okay. I'm just thinking when when it comes to the ankle monitors and everything, I I heard a lot of uh, negatives about it, but I just want to point out the effectiveness of it of keeping track. Um, the kids I've talked to that's been on it do like it a whole lot better than being locked up and also it it you know some people are looking for jobs out there but some people are not and we need to get make sure that we are monitoring them keeping track for the safety of the public and also the uh seo uh i, I like newbie was saying like the all the ones i've come in contact with they are 
really good people. I don't know how to use the words, but really good people. And, you know, they, they're they not like their sheriffs. They're not just going to go in, barge in your house, and just ramp shot everything. You know, they actually care about what they do. They care about the people they're doing it for. And it's really for safety. If nothing is there, you know, they're not, you know, going to tank or try to throw something under the bus, throw someone under the bus because they don't like them or something. That's not how they work. You know, everyone I've come across will be has been some really good people, uh, especially when they've been promoted to supervisors. You know, they really listen to what we have to say and everything. They some really good people work for that uh, department. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Pablo Ortiz. Pablo, you are unmuted. You can begin. Okay, thank you. I have uh, basically two comments uh, to make. One is with regards to item number five. I'm a supervisor at one of the halls and I'm tired of being disrespected. Uh, we've asked for more supervisors even before we were we uh, were found out of compliance. And, you know, all of a sudden they're posting the, the positions now. Previous administration also requested supervisors and some of us personally asked Adolfo and he always appears to be clueless. Uh, we're asking a vote of no confidence on Adolfo. The halls are in shambles thanks to his administration. Uh, lastly, there's a, my other comment with, with, with respect to, uh, you know, the field officers, uh, you know, they do not have juvenile training, uh, and no SEO has never in the history of the department come into it, run a board and take over a building. This happened only after this movement of youth. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do not see any more hands, Chair Carrillo. Okay. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you for all your comments, everyone, and for hanging in there. It's, I know we've gone over time. As a quick reminder, be sure to follow us on social media, LA County, at, I'm sorry, at LA County POC, and visit our website at POC at LACounty.gov to subscribe to our email listing. It is now 2.51 p.m. and I joined this meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.